So, hi everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining. We're really excited to have this event. Um, we're really excited that so many people wanted to join. So, um, in terms of who we are, my name is Nassim Nobari. I'm one of the founders of Seed the Commons, which is a small grassroots organization based in San Francisco. Um, on World Food Day, uh, in October 2020, we started a webinar series titled Rethinking Food and Agriculture in a Time of COVID and Climate Change. Really, it's not only a time of COVID and climate change, it's also a time of inequality and you know many other things, but the title couldn't be all that long. Um, but basically, the idea is that food systems are central to all the crises that we're facing. It's not just about food access, it's not just about the environment, it's about so many things, including inequality and and so on and so rethinking the food system we have and I think that today is a really wonderful kind of um, culmination of that because we're actually getting a discussion going on what actions we should take and how everybody you know the 108 participants now can all play a role in that and I really think that everyone can play a very significant role so typically when I open these webinars, I just take, you know, a few seconds to give a sentence that introduces what See the Commons is. And then I say, if you guys find these webinars useful, please consider making a donation. They're free, they're open to all, but you know, this is not a, 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 an organization that's funded. Um, however, uh, you know, I realized that people don't necessarily see or realize um, the extent and the usefulness of the contributions that grassroots organizations really make. And I think that today is actually a good time for me to speak a little bit more about that, about the work of See the Commons, how we've contributed to the veganic movement, um, because it connects with a topic that we want to speak about later in the town hall, which is um, the role of grassroots groups in general and how as we move forward in changing our food systems how can we stay true to the vision of grassroots movements who often um, initiate and kind of found a lot of these visions and how can we stay true to that so i'm going to take a few minutes to give a little bit more of an intro that i than i usually do um, so and i i hope that uh the other panelists will bear with me <laughs> Um, so, See the Commons was founded by myself and Chema Hernandez Gill, who might come on camera later. Um, and we, 20 years ago, before we had even met, um, we were both very involved in the anti-war and anti-globalization movements that were happening in the early 2000s. So, 20 years ago, you know, Chema was a, climate, a media activist um, organizing protests against the WTO. Um, interviewing Vandana Shiva, those protests, that sort of thing. Um, and being anti-war and so on and having an interest in human rights, I came to think that what really mattered was to get to the root causes of, of the system, you know, the problems of the system we live in. And that meant addressing issues around land and food and food systems and corporate takeover of food, food systems. So I wanted to get involved in those sorts of struggles because that's how you address all the, all the rest of it. And a lot of people had the same type of thinking I had, which I believe is why um, so much activism around food systems and uh, has, has come to be and why notions like agroecology and so on have, have become so popular. The problem was that I'm a vegan, Chema's a vegan, people who were like us back then, most of them are not vegan anymore. Sometime around the late 2000s, the early 2010s, most of those people stopped being vegan. Um, now, and a lot of the leaders in the food movement, a lot of the people who write books, who organize, who are the head of nonprofits, who speak about um, agroecology and so on, a lot of these people, well, maybe not a lot, but I've met um, several who are ex-vegans, ex-vegetarians themselves and who now in some cases promote regenerative grazing or at least default to an idea where we should have animals in our food systems or we shouldn't be critical of that. So what we did is that we created Seed the Commons, which was originally and still officially named Mila Cayotl, 
um, to do what the rest of the food movement was doing, to fight against the corporate takeover of food systems, to put forth agroecology and so on, but to do that with a vegan or an animal liberationist ethic. Now, without going too much into it, my analysis of what was going on with all these ex-vegans and so on is that it really came down to a question of normativity and how vegans had failed to truly challenge or sufficiently challenge social norms. And we had not truly integrated the notion that a cow is no different than a dog. Um, and so when a new solution came, came around, well, we jumped onto the new solution. And so we don't put forth veganism as a solution. Instead, we work with veganism as um, something that defines our ethical parameters in the same way that if you're part of the majority, you might be in favor of GMOs or you might be in favor of organics or agroecology, but with all those different ideologies, you're not gonna eat cats and dogs. And that's just a given. And so that's how we work. Now, at another level, you can say that what happened with all these ex-vegans and ex-vegetarians who went on to promote grazing is that there wasn't any model. Everyone started to realize that what really mattered was food systems and how we're growing food and, you know, fighting against um, industrial agriculture and fighting for land rights. But when we looked at what that would mean, concretely, the only models we saw were models that had chickens and um, cows and so on. And there wasn't a vegan model of that. And so we thought we need to put forth a vegan model of that both to um, address this issue of normativity and really act as we would if we were already a majority and normalize veganism, but also just put forth this model. And so what we saw on the animal rights side was that there was a lot of really excellent animal, animal liberation activism happening on the ground, a lot of direct action and so on, fighting against something, but there was no proposal for what could possibly come after animal liberation. What would farming look like? And so, animal liberationists were not putting forth a vision. And on the other hand, food activists were saying, well, there is no vision. And the only alternative to um, an organic model with cows and chickens would necessarily be Monsanto and Bayer and so on. And so for animal liberationists, what I would say is that, and what I've said for years, is that the two main reasons I think that it's important that all animal liberationists prioritize supporting the veganic movement is first of all, we need a proposal for what our food systems can look like post-animal liberation. And also because the agricultural um, domain or discourse around agriculture is where resistance now against animal liberation is coming from. So we started our work with Seed the Commons. Um, you know, one of the things that we did was that we started organizing a forum on radical food politics, on food sovereignty, on agroecology, on food justice, et cetera, but all of that with a vegan ethic. So we never tried to create connections and make the case that veganism is the solution to all of these problems, but rather for us to become an authoritative source on all of these different issues, understanding our food systems. And then when we look at what the solution is from the ground up, it's the vegan farmers, the veganic farmers who have a platform. These are people who have existed, who've been doing it for a long time. It's not that they haven't, it's just that they have not been given visibility, be it by the animal rights movement or the small farming slash environmental, et cetera, movement. We have this interesting situation where sometimes veganic farmers are given awards and so on by small farming, um, you know, organizations or environmental organizations. And yet the same organizations are promoting this idea that you can't possibly farm organically without animals while recognizing the work of veganic farmers because it's not explicitly you know, mentioned as veganic. So in our, in our um, events, for example, at our first conference, we had a panel on agroecology, simply agroecology, not trying to say that agroecology can only be vegan or anything like that. But what was revolutionary was that 
all of the farmers there were vegans who were the ones speaking about agroecology and we wanted to build that platform for these people. And so the effect of the, that this had was that um, it really started putting it out there, putting the word out there. A lot of people found out about veganics. They hadn't found, heard about it before. Um, and we spent a lot of years just really building public awareness around this. We offered gardening classes. We thought, you know, it shouldn't only be the animal ag people offering gardening classes. We went to many conferences, did a lot of tabling and so on, got veganics, you know, covered in a newspaper and, and all these things. And so this really helped build um, awareness around the existence that uh, the existence of veganics when there was a myth that it's just not possible to farm this way. Now, um, there was very little interest amongst the animal rights crowd. And when we spoke about the importance of focusing on agriculture, um, we weren't successful in getting a lot of engagement. There were a lot of blank stares. And I think that the reason, or one of the reasons for this was that animal rights activists had typically not been involved in those same circles and those same social circles and really didn't realize what the problem was that we were talking about. So in 2018, we organized the farmers contingent of the largest climate march that has happened on the West Coast. Um, it happened in San Francisco. Um, and so when I say the farmers contingent, I don't mean just a contingent with veganic farmers. I mean that there were many contingents at this march and we took on the organizing of the only farmers contingent. And so that's been the vision of Seed the Commons, that vegans should be at the forefront of these movements, normalizing our ethical parameters and putting veganic farmers at the head of this. So we're not only talking about veganics, we talk about small farming and so on, but the veganic farmers are at the forefront of this. And um, in 2018, as I organized this, I went to as many animal rights uh, slash vegan events as I could, and I um, told them what I was doing. I showed them screenshots of the Kickstarter of Kiss the Ground, which had not come out yet. And I explained that this was where the backlash of, against animal liberation was happening. And I really got mostly blank stares, no interest. Um, and Chema and I had told ourselves, well, if we want to continue organizing, we're going to have to look more for support and engagement with other social movements, as difficult as that may be as vegans. And in effect, we actually got a grant from a non-vegan environmental nonprofit that you know, does not speak fav favorably of veganism um, to uh, invite veganic farmers to San Francisco um, so that they can march. And the thing is that this nonprofit ultimately didn't really care if the farmers were veganic or not. They were just really excited that somebody was willing to organize to bring the topic of agriculture and to bring farmer, small farmers to San Francisco. And that's really what mattered. Um, so, so that was really a big event. And then something happened after that. Vegans started getting interested. Um, the coin had finally dropped. They started hearing about Kiss the Ground and thinking, oh my God, we need to promote veganics. We need to debunk this regenerative grazing thing. And that might seem like a good thing, but what often happens is that um, grassroots organizations will do foundational work with basically no funding, and then larger nonprofits with access to funders, with brand recognition, et cetera, can then come in and build on that. Now, the reason that's not always a good thing is that the vision often changes, the strategy, the discourse, and so on. And so, as a grassroots organization, see the commons can say whatever we want and be true to, to the vision that we started out with. There's a situation where in the environmental world, it's very rare for people to be able to truly criticize grazing, to truly criticize meat consumption. Um, they can't really say those things. What I see in San Francisco is that a lot of the local conferences are funded by the dairy companies, by the grazing organization, pro-grazing organization. So of course they can't say those things. But on the vegan side, the vegans who are funded um, by the large funders and so on, they cannot say that capitalism is bad. There are some you know, strong no-nos in the vegan world as well. And so we can say whatever we want. And so that's why it's really important to support grassroots organizations. And it's not supposed to be you know, a few roots of a few grass blades, but really a lot of people behind those who can, um, who can actually name the problem. 
So what's happening now, in my opinion, in the vegan movement is that on the one hand, we have, I'm not talking about the grassroots kind of direct action activism. I'm talking here more about the professionalized world of, of um, vegan uh, advocacy. Um, is that on the one hand, we have vegan consumerism. And on the other hand, we have vegan intersectionality. And these are two sides of the same coin. And what they are promoting is basically the same world that we already have, but a vegan version of it. Vegan capitalism, vegan neoliberalism, a little bit of vegan um, philanthropy and charity and diversity politics to put a Band-Aid on the initial two. Um, but at Seed the Commons, we don't want a vegan version of that world, and we don't want a vegan version of the corporate food system. What we want is a vegan version of the vision that so grassroots social movements are putting forth in terms of agroecology, food sovereignty, truly eco-organic farming, etc. <clears throat> so um, you know, as I said, the coin dropped. A lot of people are very interested suddenly in debunking um, Kiss the Ground. We've had many, many questions around that in our previous webinars. But our strategy at See the Commons is not to always be reactive and debunk whatever uh, the world throws at us, but rather be proactive and set ourselves up as leaders and as visionaries, you know, put forth the veganic farmers who've been doing this for decades in some cases, um, to be proactive and to put forth the models that we want. So I think that today I'm the most op optimistic that I've ever been, that we can really take that space. There are 130 participants. I know that many more people wanted to participate and weren't able to. Um, and I think that we really actually can start taking that space and getting the ball rolling and being proactive in putting forth um, ecological vegan models and, and showing the, the food movement what can be done, that um, the agroecology movement has shown us that we don't live in a world of scarcity. We can do without the inputs and so on of big ag. And now we can go a step further and say we can do all of that, but also without animal exploitation. So thank you for bearing with me. I'm very happy that um, we have our three guests here today. We're going to have a discussion, uh, a couple presentations, and then there's going to be a Q&A with three people. So I'm going to read you the bio. I think I'll start, yeah, I'll start with Mona's bio, um, and then she's going to present, and then it'll be Axel, and then we have a Q&A where Johannes will also join us. All right. Um, so... Dr. Mona Seymour is an Associate Professor of Urban and Environmental Studies at Loyola Marymount University. Um, her research interests broadly concern the relationships between veganism and animal liberation and agri-food movements. She is currently working on a project on veganic farming in the United States in collaboration with Alicia Utter at the University of Vermont. The project focuses on the values, experiences, and farming practices of U.S. veganic growers. Thank you so much, Mona, for being here. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here uh, with you all this morning. Um, and I wanna say thank you to Nassim and Chema for inviting me to give a talk in their webinar series. Um, in fact, I wanna thank their organization, Seed the Commons, and for introducing me to the existence of veganic agriculture in the first place. Um, I had no idea that this existed until um, some of their work around it in 2015 that I happened to come across. So since that point in time, um, I've been trying to learn how I can support veganic agriculture and primarily in the US, but of course uh, beyond as well. And as Nassim mentioned, um, a few years ago, I began a research project with Alicia Utter on um, US veganic farmers. And I'm gonna transition to the slides that I have for you now. Alrighty, so um, in fact, this is Alicia's farm or a little bit of Alicia's farm in the background on all of my slides. So um, she runs a veganic farm out in Vermont as well as being um, a graduate student there. Um, so I I'm really pleased to be here today to share some observations about uh, the state of veganic farming in the United States. And um, my talk is gonna be heavily based on the research that Alicia and I have been doing. 
Um, but also it's going to be doing um, or based on uh, my more general interest in supporting veganic farming in the United States and um, my evolving interest in understanding veganics more deeply as a movement. Um, and I have to say, I'm also very excited to hear perspectives from Axel on the status of biocyclic vegan farming in Europe. And I think you all will find it to be a really interesting uh, comparison between our two presentations. Um, very cool opportunity for all of us to learn about similarities and differences and um, where veganics is in those two regions. Um, so my approach today is going to be to compare veganics in the U.S. to the organic farming movement in the U.S., um, which is, of course, a more mature movement. And then if time permits, I want to share a few thoughts about what could shape the course of veganics over um, the coming years and decades. So um, my point of entry here is going to be something um, that came up in conversation over the past few years with a few experienced veganic farmers and also longtime organic farmers. Um, this small consensus formed that uh, veganic today may be where organics was in the US circa the late 1960s, early 1970s. And I have on my slide here this quote from Brian Obach, who is a scholar of the US organic movement. And he nicely outlines where organic agriculture was in the US 50 years ago. Um, so I'm gonna do some of the ideas on this slide as talking points. And I'm also gonna add in some additional key points of comparison. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to peruse the quote on the slide, and if not, um, I'm going to pull out specific parts from it as we move forward. Um, so in terms of who is growing veganically in the United States, um, very similar to the organic movement of about 50 years ago, we're talking about um, a very small number of farms, and there are under 75 known veganic farms in the United States. Um, and you can see these farms in the mapping project that I've linked here. Um, it's a project that I've been trying to do for the past couple of years to keep track of veganic farms in Canada and the US and Mexico. And Nasi Menchema kindly linked to the project on veganic.world, which is the website that Seed the Commons maintains um, to support um, and educate about veganic growing. Um, so almost all of the US farms that I'm aware of are quite small in terms of their production acreage. Um, many seem to be two acres or less. And I am aware of a couple in the eight to 10 acre range. Um, and perhaps there are one or two that are, are larger than that. Um, and then almost all of these farms are diversified, like diversified fruit and veg farms, and almost all of them are soil-based operations. In terms of why folks are doing veganic agriculture, um, similar to the condition of the organic movement about 50 years ago, this is a population of farmers who are critical of some status quo. Um, so they're critical of industrial and chemical-based agriculture, and beyond that, they're also critical of the use of animal products in organic agriculture. Um, in the study that Nassim and I have both mentioned, um, the, the farmers in our sample uh, had ethics-based motivations. So some of these folks were farming because of vegan ethics. Some of them um, had strong ethics about soil care or about environmental health or about safe food. Um, Probably most veganic farmers in the US, if not all of them, um, are growing this way because of a reflection of their values, um, as opposed to because veganic is a well-marketed, highly profitable approach here. In terms of public familiarity with veganics, um, similar to the organic situation 50 years ago, uh, consumer awareness or public awareness of veganics is really low. Um, a few years ago, I was talking with a veganic farmer who grows in Southern California, and he said that one of his dreams is to see a veganic have the same household name recognition as organic does. Um, but, you know, this lack of familiarity, there are probably a few factors that explain it. And 
One of them probably is that there is not a whole lot of opportunity for the public to encounter veganic products. Um, given the small number of farmers who are growing this way, and given that they appear to rely most heavily on local marketing avenues, so CSAs and farm stands and that sort of thing. Um, and it, this uh, lack of public familiarity is probably also linked to the lack of products that are labeled um, veganic. So this word isn't out there um, in any major way. I have come across one exception to this that I put it on the slide. Um, there's a Canadian company called One Degree Organic, and they contract with veganic grain producers um, throughout the Americas. There are maybe one or two in the US, but they seem mostly to be from Canada and Mexico and South America. And this company manufactures pastas and cereals and breads and that sort of thing, um, which they distribute to grocery chains such as Whole Foods and Routes. Um, and they use the word veganic in their packaging. I've noticed over the past few years that um, how often they use it or their, their placement of the word on their products has kind of varied. They kind of go in and out on it. Um, but this would be probably the main way that the average consumer might encounter that term veganic. Um, and we can also note that this shows us a little bit of corporate involvement of, um, in veganics um, in North America. In terms of research, um, a US research base for veganics, similar to organics 50 years ago, there's not a whole lot of agronomic research based in um, US veganic farms. There is a really long running um, 30 plus year field trial at the Rodale Institute in Pennsylvania that does in fact include an animal product free trial. Um, although I've never seen them affiliate this research with the term veganic or stock free organic or anything familiar. Um, and then Helen Atow, who is a veganic farmer currently in Oregon, has done some research um, relevant to plant-based fertility on some of her own farms. And she has findings available through the eOrganic website. But really, um, it's European countries, European research agendas that have been driving research on veganic methods um, for decades now. And then finally on this slide, um, similar to the case of organics 50 years ago in the US, uh, there is no veganic research program or grant program or legislation or certification program and label through any state or national government channel in the United States. Um, at this point, I'm gonna step away from the OBAC quote that I showed you on the last slide and touch on a couple more points of comparison that weren't represented in that quote. So um, here uh, I have an idea about institutional support as a comparator point. And so similar to the case of organics 50 years ago and even 40 years ago, um, there's no institutional support for veganics from the state or from universities. For instance, um, I have never been able to find a university course on veganic production. Um, I've not been able to find a veganic agriculture certificate program at a community college. Um, and this extends to a lack of veganic trained extension agents for farmers to reach out to, um, which the quotations on this slide um, nod to. And this in fact, constitutes one of the major challenges that Alicia and I have um, identified in our research. Technical knowledge seems very difficult to come by um, because it's not available through the usual formal channels that a farmer could um, typically expect to get education through or assistance through. Um, and this impacts current veganic farmers, of course, um, some of whom want to learn from someone um, or be able to consult with someone, particularly about soil health and fertility in plant-based systems. And we also heard some desire for better answers for managing free living animals beside um, the usual list of lethal control options. Um, this lack of formal education and support is also something that might be an entry barrier to new farmers who want to try veganics as well. Um, this is not to say that there are zero resources, of course. Um, there are resources from within the movement. Um, there are several farmer authored books between North America and Europe that would be available um, 
for reading and a couple farms who run internship or training programs. But the idea here on the slide is that there's not the same level of support for um, vegan farmers that, for instance, organic farmers enjoy today. And then the final point on this slide is, um, like organics 50 years ago and further back, there's no universally accepted definition of veganic in the United States, um, not even amongst veganic practitioners. I also want to um, mention a couple of things that were happening in the veganic, or excuse me, the organic farming world um, circa 1970 that have not happened for veganics, not yet, um, not currently. Um, at any rate, the early 1970s held some pretty big developments for organic agriculture. Um, one of them was that in the early 1970s, um, the US organic movement uh, advanced in the sense that formalization began. Um, so this began in a very decentralized way with the formation of state and regional farmers associations. And the intention with these associations was really to connect farmers um, for purposes like sharing best practices and creating a sense of community and identity. Um, so those quotes on the slide kind of attest to that. So the main organic farmers and gardeners association formed in 1971, I believe that was the first one to form. Um, and out here in California, um, CCOF, California Certified Organic Farmers, was established in 1973. Um, and then standards and certification are another point here on the slide, um, because also in the early 1970s, the first formal set of criteria for organic production was established um, by the Rodale Institute. And um, shortly after that, the main organic farmers and gardeners association started offering its own certification in 1972. Um, that was based in the Rodale uh, organic standards, but um, more sets of criteria started to come out right after this from the organic farmers associations that were forming um, that were specific to those associations. Um, another thing that was going on with these associations was that they were trying to codify what their farmers were doing and what should qualify as organic um, and to develop procedures for certifying um, authentically organically produced um, foods. So by about 1975, there were 11 or so organizations in the US that were offering organic certification based on their own distinct sets of standards. Um, so comparing this to veganics in the US today, there are currently no um, veganic farmers associations in the United States, and there's currently no US-based veganic certification. Um, the Certified Naturally Grown program, which some of you may be familiar with, uh, did briefly offer a veganic certification, um, perhaps around the year 2008, but I understand that it was shut down due to lack of participation. Um, although, of course, US veganic farmers could look abroad to something like the stock-free standard or the biocyclic vegan standard, both of which are based in Europe, um, and we'll hear about one of them shortly from Axel, um, so those are options. And so that was my overview of where veganic farming is in the US right now as compared to um, a more mature farming movement. And I want to spend my last couple minutes here talking a little bit about um, what might shape veganics in the years and decades to come. Um, Noting that this is such a young movement, um, what are some things that might uh, determine its path? And what I'm gonna talk through here um, is certainly by no means a complete list of possibilities, but just some things that have kind of risen to the top of my mind um, recently. So I think for one, it'll be important to watch the relationship between veganics and agribusiness. Um, if US veganic farmers were to organize and draw up a standard or several sets of standards, um, or if the government were to get involved and create the kind of infrastructure that organic agriculture has now, or really if there were any other very clear um, indicators of the marketability and profitability of veganics, we might um, anticipate an uptick in corporate interest. And 
this would be, of course, um, this prediction is based upon the experience of organic agriculture in the United States. Um, so this could change veganics quite a lot from how it primarily manifests in the United States um, as a small scale, diversified, values driven um, family farming um, type of farming. I also think it's going to be really interesting to watch the relationship of veganics to the movement that is seeking to transition livestock farmers um, out of animal agriculture and into plant-based agriculture and green energy. Um, I have a, a picture off to the side of the slide from one of the organizations working in this movement. Um, and I'll also say that in the United States, the, the rancher advocacy program has made it explicit that veganic farming is what farmers ought to transition to in the context of um, plant agriculture. So this could certainly have bearing on veganics in terms of visibility. Um, and also maybe in terms of financial resources and educational resources. Um, more broadly, maybe, maybe kind of linked to that point, but much more broadly, um, I've really been wondering about uh, changing attitudes toward animal agriculture and um, what that might mean for veganics. So um, in the global north, there is this increasingly strong criticism of the climate and environmental and food safety and food security and public health and labor and animal welfare impacts of industrial animal agriculture. Um, and we're seeing markets for plant-based milks and eggs and meats growing really rapidly. Um, we're seeing expanded R&D for lab grown or cultured meats. Um, we're also observing some industries like dairy contract and I kind of wonder if all of this is going to have bearing on um, the widespread and cheap availability of animal-based fertility, um, which could lead to more farmer interest in plant-based fertility practices. Um, the last comment that I want to make is that I think it's going to be important to watch whether and how support for all small-scale diversified farmers evolves in the United States. Um, for instance, through something like the Farm Bill. Um, I say this because the farmers who participated in the research that Alicia and I um, undertook, you know, they, they face veganic specific challenges, of course, um, a couple of which I mentioned earlier in the presentation, but also all of them, all of them reported facing um, many of the same issues that other small farmers face. Um, so for instance, land access and land tenure and time and financial constraints. Um, so this is to say that the viability of veganic farming, the future of veganic farming, um, in part depends on the kinds of support that is made available to the much larger pool of small and ecological and fruit and veg farmers. So um, I'm going to end here. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks for letting me share this overview of um, veganics as compared to organics and some thoughts on directions. Um, and thanks again to Nassim and Chama for um, having me on this. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my share here. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, uh, so the Q&A for the panelists is going to be at the end. So we're not going to ask any questions directly now to Mona, but you can ask them afterwards, obviously. And you can also start putting your questions in the Q&A. Um, it's better to, if you have actual questions as opposed to just, you know, you want to share a thought, which is totally fine. Um, but if you have actual questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A uh, function that makes it easier for us to track. Um, and then you can you can put your question now and then we can get to it later in the Q&A segment. All right, so our next speaker is Axel Anders. Our next and last speaker, then we're going to the Q&A where we'll also be joined by um, the third panelist. So Axel Anders um, helped found the International Biocyclic Vegan Network. He studied psychology, drama, linguistics, and business administration in France and Germany. Already during his university years, he became involved in the organic farming movement and came into contact with the organic pioneer Adolf Hoops back in the early 1980s. Although his professional journey took him in a different 
direction in language teach, teaching, international business and publishing, his interest in organic farming remained alive. In 2016, when recognizing the need for a consistently vegan form of organic agriculture, he connected German stakeholders in veganic farming with the biocyclic network in Greece, Cyprus, thereby initiating the de development of biocyclic vegan agriculture. Currently, Axel Anders lives and works in Berlin. As a co-founder of the Adel Hoop Society, the international standard and label organization for biocyclic vegan agriculture, he is primarily involved in the international development of the biocyclic vegan activities. All right, so we're so happy that you can be here with us. We're really excited to, um, you know, internationalize this conversation. I don't think that it should remain in these uh, national uh, or even continental silos. And so we're so happy that we're able to have the perspective both from North America and from Europe. And at our next event, it'll be even more global as a conversation. But for now, we're really excited to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nassim, first of all, to invite me and that I can be part of this very exciting meeting. Uh, I think I had heard about uh, veganic farming for a long time, and I, especially now listening to what Mona said, there is a lot of things we have in common. The situation is very similar in Europe and in America, and I think we can really learn a lot from each other and also uh, share our experiences. Uh, I know that we have a very strict program today, so I just want to share my thoughts with my presentation. So I just hope that I can now uh, do the screen sharing and it can work. Yeah, okay, good, yeah. So let's start. If we want to talk about biocyclic vegan farming, I want to take you back somehow in the history. Uh, you heard the name of Adolf Hobbes already. He was a pioneer of organic farming, uh, starting his experiences in the 1950s. And from the very beginning, he was convinced that the future of agriculture will be organic. So it's really something, a healthy soil life and biodiversity and all the issues we are still discussing today. But also at the same time, we recognized that humanity will evolve towards an increasingly plant-based diet. And uh, this is a problem because uh, in organic farming, there is the uh, principle that normally you need animal husbandry, you need animal manure and even slaughterhouse waste for fertilization. And this is really a problem. So uh, he said, if we really want to have this kind of development uh, and there will be mankind only eating plant-based in the future, uh, then we will have mountains of meat, which we cannot use anymore because we don't eat the animals. So we have to look for a new form of organic agriculture that in order to achieve sustainable soil fertility can do without livestock and all kind of animal inputs. So he started to work on these principles and in his farm he created in the north of Germany, uh, north, uh, south, south of Hamburg, the bio model Waldrode. It was kind of a model farm he created and he had a lot of people coming to see him, learning from him. And he organized seminars and meetings. And this was also when in the 1980s, I went to see him and I learned a lot from him and I organized seminars with him also. And in this occasion, one of these meetings, a friend of mine, Johannes Eisenbach, whom you are going to meet very soon now, he was a student in those days and he uh, came to one of these lectures and got to know Adolf Hobbes. And they really found that they had a lot of things to say to each other and to learn from each other. So Johannes Eisenbach went to Greece and helped to build up organic farming in Greece. And then he invited Adolf Hobbes to come and give him advice that he can really, that he could develop and adapt the principles he had found out in Germany to adapt them to the Mediterranean region. And so they worked for quite a while, they worked together and Adolf Hobbes every year he went there, spent half a year of, in winter in Greece and they really worked intensely together. When Adolf Hobbes died in 1999, uh, the work continued. Adolf Hobbes was not someone who wrote a lot of things. He was a man of word, and of action. So, but he had all these ideas uh, uh, very well developed. And so Johannes Eisenbach and the son of Adolf Hobbes, Arne Hobbes, they sat together and worked out uh, in writing all the principles that had been discovered uh, by Adolf Hobbes. And it was a very good situation. Arne Hobbes and also Adolf Hobbes, the family, they were the one of the founding 
family of one of the big organic movements, uh, farmers associations in Germany, the Bioland uh, Association, and they had a lot of experience in what uh, organic means and what organic standard means, what organic certification means. And so they really went uh, and put down something which became a real organic, a new organic standard. And this is the biocyclic guidelines, uh, which were developed in those days for organic farming. And they were applied from the very beginning in Greece with a lot of a network of a of number of great number of farms in Greece. And uh, it was it's a great principles for a very uh, healthy way of organic farming. And uh, from the very beginning, a standard which is also possible to get certified in, with uh, official uh, accredited uh, certifying bodies. Now we go a big step further. In, 19, in 19, 2016, uh, we call it the Berlin Initiative. After a long time abroad, I came back to Germany. I was a big vegan in that time, and I was getting involved in the vegan movements in Germany. And also, it's particularly heard about vegan organic farming for the first time. And then I met uh, activists from these groups, and I said, well, what you are doing, it is very close what Adolf Hobbes did in the past and what Johannes Eisenbach is doing in Greece, you should meet each other. And so I helped that these groups, the vegan uh, bio veganist network, vegan organic network in Germany, met Johannes Eisenbach and he introduced the biocyclic guidelines to them. And everybody got very excited because they said, well, this is really a standard which is practically a vegan standard. It was not called vegan. And at the time it still had some aspects it was plant-based, but it still tolerated some animal husbandry in certain cases uh, in a limited way. But it was very easy to transform it because the spirit and the principles were already vegan. And so this group sat together and with Johannes Eisenbach and we formed a team and we worked to elaborate the vegan aspects of the biocyclic guidelines. And this very quickly became the biocyclic vegan standard, a new organic standard, which now is the first vegan organic standard, which is applicable and certifiable worldwide. The next step was that this standard became a member of the IFARM family of standards. IFARM is the International Organization of Organic Farming Movements. It has very strict criteria for the standards which can be used worldwide. And this is now the only global standalone standard for vegan organic farming, which can be used in every country for, as a basis for certification. This was kind of, also kind of a grassroots movement. So the background is the same, but we felt if this needs, if this has to be developed further, there needs some legal structure, there needs some organization and framework behind it. So we decided to create the Adolf Hope Society in Berlin, which is meant to be the standard and label organization for the future development of biocyclic vegan farming. And uh, this Hope Society, is meant to be a not-for-profit society, not a company which really works for the, for the cause and not for the private profit. It is the editor of the Biocyclic Vegan Standard, but at the same time, it also controls the Biocyclic Vegan Standard Commission, which is a commission of experts from farming, animal rights, certification, and, and members of the network who uh, survey the development of the vegan uh, biocyclic vegan standard and who also uh, in critical situation when a, an auditor on a farm sees a problem they can decide uh, what the right solution is so that it is something which is not just in the hand of one person but it's this commission which is now supervising the development of the standard the other hoop society is also the owner of the biocyclic vegan quality label which is the little logo which, see, which you see in the, right, the green little label you can see there. And also the uh, society is a coordinating body for the International Biocyclic Vegan Network. The label is something I want to tell you uh, is in, in our point of vision, it is uh, something very important. If you work in a small community, uh, farm has confidence with uh, the people from the neighborhood, uh, everybody knows this is an organic farm, they don't keep animals. But as soon as you want to get into a larger distribution network, this trust cannot be uh, found uh, automatically. So in this case, uh, a label and a certification is really something which is quite important. 
and actually it provides full transparency for consumers at all levels of the supply chain and gives them the assurance that the products labeled in this way have been grown not only organically but also according to vegan principles and this uh, requires a certain organization for inspection, certification, and uh, the use of the label. And I want to just show you a bit of this organization, which looks complex, but it's a very simple idea behind it. But just to give you an idea how the label organization is working now. So I told you about the Adolf Hope Society, which is the owner of the label and also the standard, working with the Standard Commission, uh, which develops the standard. And for the certification, Adolf Hope Society cannot do the certification itself, but there is an official accredited body, which is Ceres. It's a German-based organization which uh, works for certification in many countries in the world. They have their own subsidiaries and they also work with partners. So they have local partners in many countries, local accredited control bodies who, whom they can delegate the inspection on the particular farm. So this is in a way the structure uh, on several levels when, you, when it comes to certification and inspection on the farm. If in order to put this into practice, we need uh, some network, some surrounding and some partners in the countries who help to implement this. And these are the national regional biocyclic vegan member organizations. They are like farmers associations, but they are more because there are also lots of activists and people who think it's important to support this activity. So it's not only open for farmers, they have to be members if they want to be certified and also uh, food processing companies who want to be certified for their products. They have to be members, but there's a lot of people just from the different communities who also want to join in and to help to develop the biocyclic vegan movement. The whole structure needs some more support. Uh, there is a company in Cyprus which already worked for the biocyclic network in the past. So there is some facility with office and and uh, administration, which is quite helpful. Uh, so it can, from this side, do all the orientation work, the training, uh, the consulting and advice, which is needed on all levels for training the auditors in the different countries, which becomes easier now because of what we experience with all the Zoom conferences. So we can do a remote control and training much more easily than in the past. It also helps the institutions to be set up and on the other hand, we need also the uh, label uh, legal system, which is the vegan uh, label limited, uh, just created a few weeks ago, uh, which helps to administer the different contracts, uh, which have to be made with the operators, with the farmers, the uh, different biopsychic organizations. And uh, this is uh, uh, because there need to be cooperation contracts license agreements and so on and so on. And this is done by this organization. For the operator in the middle, for the farmer, it looks very complicated, but the partner uh, he has to talk to is basically the local control body. It is the member organization. He needs a contract with the label organization. And once he is certified, he will get the certificate from the service organization. Then it, the rest is just the framework, uh, which is there to make the whole thing work. So. If you want to know more about it, just go on our website. I show you the link at the end, and there is more detailed information on this. Behind this, I told you there is the Biocyclic Vegan Network. So we have different network organizations in various countries already. There's the German one, which is also responsible for other German countries like Austria and Switzerland. There's the French one, France, Belgium, and Switzerland. The Dutch one being responsible for Holland, Netherlands, and the Flemish speaking part of Belgium. There is the Greek speaking network in Greece and Cyprus. And recently, uh, the Swedish organization was created. So it's quite new, new and young and with a lot of enthusiasm. So the whole network is growing. We have farms already being certified in Italy, in Romania. We are speaking now with uh, Brazil for a cooperative of small uh, older family farms uh, for cashew nuts. We are talking to South Africa. We have some discussion with Canada and hopefully with the United States very soon as well. There is a map. Uh, it looks a bit like Mona's map as well for the vegan farming.org. 
uh, where we show all our partner companies and not only farms, but also processing companies and so on. But also we showcase the vegan organic network in the UK who are good friends of us and we work very closely together. And also we have some farms which are, we call them self-declared vegan farms. They are not uh, certified, but they work e vegan veganically. And we want to showcase that there is a big potential of a large number of farms working. And some of them are on the way also to become biocyclic vegan. And this map has been set up by our friends in France. It's a French organization. They are called Vegan France Interpro, and they also organize the biocyclic vegan organization there. Just to give you some impression of our farmers, we have small scale farmers like in Sweden, like a permaculture garden. We have community supported agriculture like this one in Berlin, supplying German capital with vegetable boxes. We have apple growers in the south of Germany, a beautiful vineyard in the south of France near Bordeaux in Bergerac, Dordogne. We have uh, arable farming in Austria and Hungary uh, with beans, sunflower seeds, uh, wheat and cereals. Another one in Romania, these are big farms. So we really range from permaculture up to large scale farming uh, up to this, these ones are about more than 2,500 acres. So it's really already big here, but it's still a family farm. It's a family owned farm. And we have a grower in North of Holland in the Netherlands growing vegetables, olive growers in Greece, vegetable grower in Switzerland, oranges in Cyprus and so on and so on. And just to have some impression of the different products without many words, these are pomegranates, which are very beautiful in Cyprus. These are squashes. So you just see the impression of all we have. And there are even bananas in Europe, in Crete, biocyclic vegan bananas for the first time. And this is the project which will be certified very soon, cashew nuts from Brazil, apple juice in Germany, beautiful wine from France. And there is a company now in uh, Austria already packaging uh, and they have to create, uh, created an own brand uh, of biocyclic vegan products. And they are already in the uh, natural health food stores, a big chain in Austria where they are already uh, available like this. So this is just to give you an impression. Quickly, let's go to the different tasks and challenges our organizations have. As I said, the organizations they are like kind of pillars for all the work. So there we can really create the help for the farmers and for the whole movement. And uh, especially like it works in the German association very well. We have different work groups who really address the different issues we have for the development of the movement. The first one is the farmers. We have to help them to, to motivate them to be convert to biocyclic vegan farming. We need to give them information, training and support. And we have to, have to help them to develop distribution channels for certified products because they are economic companies and they have to survive. So they won't be interested if they have not a problem to commercialize their, pro their, their products. We have to work, this is the reason why also we have a work group and some people involved in working with the food processing industry and trade because they have to develop product lines based on biocyclic vegan raw materials and they have to commercialize them under the biocyclic vegan label. If the first company producing oat milk, for instance, says this one is 100% vegan from field to table because it's grown veganically or biocyclic vegan way, then in that case, the first one is a signal. The others will have to follow because people, the consumers, they will understand, oh, well, what we are eating is not really vegan. This is a new perspective. It's a new dimension of vegan. So this is the next group which we have to address to consumers and the general public, create awareness about the existence and benefits of biocyclic vegan products with all the different channels which are at our disposal. So we have people working on this to give all the information. And this also helps to generate the market demand. And we need the support of science to provide scientific evidence regarding the feasibility and benefits of biocyclic vegan agriculture. In all the areas like soil fertility, so often we hear, oh, it doesn't work. You, you need animal fertilizers, otherwise you won't maintain soil fertility. But now we are working in this group, we have a work group working with students, researchers, universities, research institutes, and there are already field trials taking place to compare at long period, long time period, if biocyclic vegan uh, fertilization 
uh, which kind of yields they give. And there were, yes, in a, at the University of Athens in Greece, there were very good results, even better than uh, conventional farming. So we have to work with the different NGOs uh, to look for the synergies in all the areas which are close to what we are doing. And uh, it is really, uh, not all of them understand the meaning of biocyclic vegan farming or veganic farming in general, because uh, they want to reduce animal uh, factory farming. They want to uh, promote uh, plant-based and vegan diet, but they are not really aware what this uh, means with respect to agriculture. And there we also have to do a lot of work to get them motivated to promote biopsychic vegan farming as a key solution for the big problems we have in our, in our world today. And this means also everybody knows fundraising. Uh, we need public funding. We need public from NGOs who are already private sponsors. Politics, we need to support. It's exactly the same what also Mona says. We need to create awareness of the potential of organic agriculture with respect to all the different uh, problems we're having in this world. And this means they have to include biocyclic vegan farming in government programs. And we are very happy that we have already small little little help for the, for instance, the German, uh, is the German uh, federal government admin agency for the environment. They gave us a project to help us to develop more networking. So they start to understand that there is an issue in this biostatic vegan farming, and they want to start very, very timidly to support us, which is a very big progress we're having already. So just in a few words to come to the end of my presentation, what actually biocyclic vegan agriculture needs, its visibility being perceived as a key solution to major global issues, scientific evidence versus myth and fake news, robust political and financial support, education and training structures, market access. And this again will help to motivate farmers to convert to biocyclic vegan agriculture. And this is the work of the national and regional associations of farmers and, and activists who can help to promote this kind of development. Just a small conclusion, biocyclic vegan agriculture is part of the paradigm shift of the entire agriculture and food system, which is actually taking place. However, we cannot wait until the prevailing mindset tips over and society, politics, and all stakeholders open up for this transformation. The members of the International Biocyclic Vegan Network just do in a very pragmatic way what they consider to be necessary. And I think this is our attitude. Just we know that these things do work and we must do it and prove that it's possible. And by this convince other people by the example and, and just become stronger in this way. This was what I just wanted to show. Uh, it, giving you an idea. I hope we have some more opportunity to answer your questions and this should just trigger off a discussion and an exchange which can go beyond our today's meeting and I thank you very much. I had the opportunity to be with you and open for your questions and your discussion and Johannes Eisenbach I think he will join us as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Axel. Yeah, I agree. This is definitely the start of a longer conversation. Certainly, we're not going to be able to cover everything today. Um, before we open uh, the Q&A, and I am going to introduce Johannes, I just wanted to comment on a couple of things I saw in the chat and Q&A um, while the panelists were speaking. So first of all, someone asked a question, and I accidentally clicked answer live when I actually wanted to type the answer, and now I can't type it anymore. <laughs> Zoom won't let me. Um, so someone just asked to do uh, if large um, if the livestock industry is linked to mainstream quote organic fertilizers. Uh, that has a clear answer at least in Canada and the United States. Yes, I mean if you're buying organic produce or organic products of any sort in the US and Canada, at least I imagine in Europe it's similar, but I can't. I don't have that knowledge. Um, you know, it's it's most likely that the fertilizers used did come from not only animal agriculture, but in most cases, uh, industrial animal agriculture. So it, there's really kind of no way around that. So what I used to say in my presentations is that, you know, the food movement has conveniently put forth 
a false dichotomy between sustainability um, and um, you know, and veganism saying, oh, we can only do sustainability with animal agriculture. And that's not true. But as of yet, for consumers, that is actually true in the sense that if you're a consumer, um, you can either buy the products of industrial agriculture or you can buy the products of organic agriculture and organic agriculture is invariably grown with animal fertilizers and the vast majority of those times it's not you know the manure of the cow on the family farm it's actually the byproducts of factory farming and slaughterhouses so you know anything that actually two days ago i took a class i hope megan is here i took a class on a vegan organic veganic gardening class with um, the people from Learn Veganics, and they were speaking about all the, you know, products that make their way into so-called organic fertilizers. Basically, you know, animals can be given antibiotics and so on, um, but then that the byproducts can be used in organic farming. So the original animal doesn't have to be part of an organic farm. So yes, that's the case. Um, I wanted to just, if you guys allow me, I. Um, I, Yvonne actually had a really interesting comment, and I hope that you guys won't mind if I say something about that. Um, so Yvonne pointed out that One Degree Organics, which is a veganic company in, based in Canada, or a so-called veganic company, I guess we could have a debate on that, um, that the farms that they source from are often not vegan farms, that these are farms that often have animal husbandry happening. So maybe they grow, for example, a uh, field, you know, they grow wheat and then that wheat is not grown with animal inputs, but then in a different part of the farm, they're also raising pigs and doing their own thing and maybe they produce bacon or who knows. Um, so yeah, that's true. Um, I don't, I, this is, you know, opens up a larger conversation, but what I want to note is a couple things. First of all, on the website, veganic.world, which is our website, we have on one hand, the map, and then on the other hand, there's a different tab with a list of farms. And so we actually have different criteria because for the purposes of Mona and Alicia's research, um, you know, and I can't tell them how to do their research and what criteria to use, you know, that makes sense in the context of that research, they wanted to go with a certain definition of um, veganics as to the inputs and so on. And on the other tab, which is uh, find a farm, I think, our criteria as see the commons is that a veganic farm is a vegan farm, meaning there's no animal husbandry anywhere on the farm. Um, and so that means that there's not an exact overlap on the map and the list, which I thought was useful to be able to have both of those things, because on the map, you will have some farms that might be veganic, but might not be vegan. Whereas on the list, you have farms that are veganic in the sense that ethically they are are also vegan and they don't engage in animal exploitation. Um, and a few years ago with the People's Harvest Forum, what we actually really wanted to do if we had had the funding to do that is that we wanted to be able to invite many veganic farmers and growers um, to have a discussion about what the definition of veganic really should be. And what uh, I think Joe Kilcoyne, he has a way of describing it that I personally find useful. Joe Kilcoyne um, is a vegan um, farmer and uh, he gives uh, you know permaculture design courses that are vegan um, and runs a sanctuary so he distinguishes between vegan and veganic but vegan can also be vegan and organic in the sense that um, uh, you can have veganic farming that you know where there might be animal husbandry, but let's say you can have veganic farming where there's none of that. And then in the case of an animal sanctuary, you might have people who actually have animals and because they have animals and they're permaculturists and they don't want to be wasteful, they're going to reuse the manure of the animals in the same way that in their case, they actually use humanure. 
And so technically it's not veganic because they're using animal inputs, but it is vegan in the sense that there's no animal exploitation and um, you know, they're just running a sanctuary. So I think it's important that at some point we come together and have this discussion. Um, I saw that Renee mentioned that there's a committee about the term veganics. I would, you know, I would want to put the idea out there that I think it's important that these discussions be led by farmers and growers themselves and not the people um, like Mona and I, for example, who want to have a supportive role. We can support them, but it's not for us to really lead those conversations. Um, all right. So, all right. <laughs> so we're going to move on to the Q&A. Um, I'm going to introduce the third participant. We're very happy that you're able to join us. Um, so Dr. Johannes Eisenbach is a co-founder and partner at the Adel Hoop Society. Um, Dr. Johannes Eisenbach, orig originally from Germany, is a trained farmer and agricultural economist. Involved in the organic movement since the early 1980s, he relocated to Greece in 1995, where he played a major role in the development of organic agriculture. In addition to providing training and consultancy for conversion farms, he has built up an extensive distribution network to give producers from Greece and Cyprus, mostly small-scale family farms, access to the international export markets. In collaboration with, in collaboration with the German organic pioneer Adolf Hoops and his son Arn, he developed the biocyclic standard, which later expanded to become the biocyclic vegan standard. Johannes Eisenbach is a co-founder of the Adel Hoop Society, the international standard and label organization for biocyclic vegan agriculture. And he is the chairman slash coordinator of several associations and committees, including the Biocyclic Vegan Standard Commission. So now all of us are here. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to and I'm going to open um, with the question. So basically I'll be uh, reading out some of these. And if the person hasn't specified for whom the question is, you know, all of you can answer, just one of you can answer, feel free to do what you, you know, what seems best. So the first question is from Silish Rouse. Hi Silish. Um, do, does the biocyclic veganic movement also cover vegan food forests, not just farms? Maybe I think Johannes, uh, you have the best experience. Uh, from my side, I think uh, it's it's biocyclic vegan standard covers everything. It's a principle. It's an approach. It's not a technique for different. So it goes from permaculture to to agriculture in general. It's uh, so I think food forests, of course, if they obey to the same principles, of course. What strategies do you think there are for feeding people living in, well, well, okay, sorry. Um, I'm just going to add that next week we are going to do a webinar with two veganic farmers who are commercial farmers who've been successful for decades. So next week we're actually going to go more into the details of um, veganic farming in the ground and so this week is a little bit more about issues of how to build the movement how the you know movement is organized in europe and the biocyclic network in the united states and so on so we often get a lot of questions that are very technical at our webinars um and in past webinars we've covered some of that and then next week we're going to go more into that so i'm going to not prioritize those questions as much um all right, so mainstream agricultural research in Belgium has absolutely zero interest in looking into veganic farming. I sometimes try to raise it in debates, panels, et cetera, but it is just ignored. But we need research institutes to produce data to show that it works so farmers can also be persuaded. How best approach them? Yes, maybe, maybe I, I should um, try to answer this question. Is it okay? Uh, since uh, there is a close connection, first of all, thank you for being uh, for being invited to your uh, meeting and uh, this really exciting uh, come together from from uh, Europe and uh, the US about this uh, amazing topic we are talking about. Thank you very much. 
so I think the question of uh, the connection of uh, practical um, adoption of uh, veganic principles in agriculture and research uh, has made a big step in Germany in the last uh, two years. There are two research uh, projects going on, two universities uh, as a long-term trial for 10 years. Uh, it started, uh, both started more or less in uh, 2018 and um, they, uh, it's a kind of comparison of different uh, approaches in organic farm farming. And one of the variations they are studying is biocyclic vegan agriculture. So uh, there will be a big outcome of uh, data and, uh, and also practical advice from that. Um, on the other hand, uh, we uh, Axel mentioned already um, interesting research project uh, which was conducted in Athens Agricultural University uh, with the subject of humus soil. Um, and but there is still a big need of uh, of research on every stage, uh, and uh, because you have to bear in mind that um, making the step into a really um, uh, yes, I would I would say doing biocyclic vegan uh, agriculture is a step back into the basics of organic what the pioneers of organic agriculture uh, had in mind and was, what, what was their vision, but facing the challenges of the future and combining the possibilities of future. So I think we are really uh, the link between the, the grassroots developments and what really can get out of that because of grassroots development uh, is created uh, in order to get the mainstream development. Um, it is not intended to be forever a grassroots uh, uh, development. So I think we are just in the transition phase, um, uh, but we have to, to, to be very, very careful that what you initially told us already, that uh, we have to keep in mind the initial visions uh, of organic and what, how we had called it biocyclic uh, vegan agriculture. So, and uh, just to give also an addition to what um, uh, Axel said, um, biocyclic vegan agriculture is a definition of the principles of re recycling, the principle of, of giving back to nature what it grants to us of um, the principles of being aware that we are a part of a whole system and not uh, the one which can uh, dominate everything. And um, so therefore, this set of rules and requirements, which might sound a little bit formalistic because it's a standard, it's just um, a kind of definition of the basic principles and it can be combined with every kind of methods used in agriculture, as Axel already said. It is possible to use these principles in a, in a, um, a greenhouse, in an um, open field, a vegetable uh, field, uh, in uh, uh, big, big uh, areas or in permaculture or in forest uh, food or in uh, whatever system you could invent. I would even say in vertical, even vertical agriculture, even urban farming can be combined with these principles. So what, wherever you can produce food in, um, in uh, harmony and in um, uh, uh, following the, the laws of nature, you can find a lot of solutions to do that. I actually have a question um, myself uh, for either Axel or Johannes or both, but I'm curious, um, you know, I hope this wasn't something that already was explained and that I missed, but I'm very curious about how, what's the process by which you're 
you know, by which the farms come to be part of the network or come to uh, perhaps consider going um, vegan if they're already organic, but not vegan. For example, you know, you showed your a map, there were, there's a farm, you know, in Brazil, et cetera, that are joining this network. And um, I'm curious, are these people who typically are not farming veganically yet and you're having a conversation or they're veganic and they're saying, oh, wait a minute, we're already doing that. Could you speak a bit about that? And, um, and do you have kind of like a sales pitch, I guess, for farmers, for lack of a better word? Jonas, you want to explain? Uh, yeah. you, no, if, if you like, or... <laughs> yeah, okay, um, go, because, yeah. It, 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 Actually, it's uh, as you said, uh, most of them have thought about veganic ways of agriculture many years before and uh, found their way to do that. And when they came into contact with us, they found that what they are doing is expressed in the biocyclic vegan standard. And therefore, they wanted to, be, uh, to become certified, which in these cases is really easy because they fulfill it already. And uh, but it has to be tested and to be certified, and they want to be certified in order to 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 have a, um, um, the possibility to prove it uh, against the third parties, uh, whoever this might be. Uh, of course, there are also other uh, other farms um, which uh, just heard about and want to become uh, biocyclic vegan, or they still have animals that could uh, uh, maybe Atle can uh, uh, tell you some experience of the last weeks why we have such an initiative in Switzerland and Germany. Uh, so there are different ways, but the first ever certified farms are really those who have already thought about that and have found the way in the exactly the same direction as the biocyclic vegan standard says. Mm -hmm. Maybe I, I can add also that these farmers are not necessarily vegans themselves because it, it, they just understand that this is the best way of farming. They have understood that, uh, that uh, they, they buy uh, fertilizer, organic fertilizer, and then they see it comes from slaughterhouses, it, it, it contains germs, it, it's, it smells very badly, sometimes it comes from India. And, and they say, oh, well, I don't want to put this on my plants anymore. So this is, and then gradually they think about the whole background of veganism. It's in, so they are more and more exposed to this. So it's sometimes a long process. And the other way could also be if there's really a farmer who has cows or has, has pigs, we have more and more examples like this who have really problems to, uh, to send them to the slaughterhouse and they will look for new ways. Some, of, some others may also have uh, economic reasons because they see now, uh, all the animal industry is going down and they don't make profit anymore. So they look for new ways. And uh, we have a group, it's a little association which is supporting us. Some people who uh, just say they want to accompany farmers to a new way. And then uh, the solution might be they become biocyclic vegan farmers. But sometimes they say, oh, we had animals all the time. We love animals. We don't really want to become vegetable farmers. It's, it's a big step. It's, it's, sometimes it takes years. So then they say, okay, let's keep our animals. We do something, we do a sanctuary, for instance, and then they, they can, there are business models which also work to have uh, to adopt animals and this can work. And then they start growing vegetables. It's not biopsychic vegan because we have the issue also with the manure, but so there are transition periods and the idea, one day we cannot have all farms transformed into sanctuaries, it's possible either. So there, there are different transitions possible, but every farm is individual, I think. And you cannot say it's, uh, it works like this. Like in uh, Brazil, it's another example. This is a, a couple of uh, who went there uh, helping the farmers. Uh, they got from Germany and from Spain. And they said, we have to find a, a possibility to sell the cashew nuts in Europe. And then they told them, you are small farmers and you can work this way. And they agreed to do it. And now they're building up this way. So also the impact can come from the outside sometimes. And they see as soon as there is a demand for the products, then it will be very easy to convince the farmers because they, they very often are not happy with the way they are working. And they are, there are more and more people, uh, like in Switzerland, we are working with a group uh, they have a sanctuary. They said have one, two, three, four calls every week from farmers who want to give animal husbandry and they look for new ways. 
Yeah, that's a really good point that not everyone who wants to farm veganically is actually vegan. And that's something I was going to mention earlier with One Degree of Veganics is that I don't think, you know, that they're being dishonest um, when they're using the term veganic. I don't think they're saying, oh, we just want to do this because the consumer wants it. My understanding of One Degree Organics is that they started out with an interest of health. Um, and so and so that was an honest interest. They said, oh, you know, this is what's going on in the soil and we don't want to be consuming that. Um, and so we want to create a sort of, you know, um, we want to create a company that serves veganic products so that people can have, you know, cleaner food, so to speak, where they know that um, certain products aren't going to be in their soil and their food. Um, and that's the motivation. And, and next week, um, one of the speakers was married to a man who, you know, was a visionary veganic farmer and wasn't actually vegan, but it made sense. Um, for Mona, uh, there's a question from uh, Anna Labar. Do you think it's possible to have veganic farmers who are not vegan? All right. So and um, if so, is it possible to have an estimation of the number of farmers who have veganic practices in the US? And do you know when your manuscripts and major empirical piece will be out? Um, thanks for the question, Anna. Uh, it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat here as has, um, have just been discussed. Uh, I, I think it's entirely possible to farm veganically without um, personally being vegan um, as, as a lifestyle or a set of personal ethics or a set of um, maybe politics and and the mapping project that I run um, there are folks on that map who are not vegan um, they may be vegetarian they may be omnivores um, I think there are at least uh, a couple farms who do keep um, animals on other part of their farms so if you're looking at the the mapping project that um, I maintain any farm on there would um, fit that very narrow definition of veganic that's about animal-based inputs. So I think I said that perhaps there are 75 or so um, farms on the map that I maintain. And I would also say that that's not a complete map. Um, and that's partly because uh, I've had difficulty finding farms um, before the map because perhaps they don't use the term veganic or they don't use an associated term like vegan organic or stock-free organic or something. So I would anticipate there are farmers out there who are not present on the map because I couldn't find them or because they haven't reached out to me. Um, let's see. And then of course I would say that um, because of my own capacity, I don't have time to update and search all the time. So um, 75 is a real ballpark. Uh, in terms of our research outputs, thank you for asking for that. Um, we, Alicia and I have two manuscripts that may come out in journals this year. Um, and uh, if I can find a way to share our website with you, um, Nassim and Chema, maybe I can um, send it to you and you can send it out um, in the chat uh, if I'm not able to myself. But um, that would be a resource for you if you want to keep track of when the publications come out. Um, we're aiming for a journal called the Journal of Extension and also a journal called Agriculture and Human Values. And, you know, fingers crossed that um, they will come out later this year. Um, Nassim, was that Anna's whole question? Thank you. So just two or three more, we're already behind schedule as it happens. Um, so this person says, I have a question regarding biological pest control. This is allowed in organic, um, for example, in bio greenhouses, it works quite well. Stock-free vegan organic does not allow it. But what is um, the position of biocyclic regarding this in Europe? And uh, similarly, the I guess the position of veganic in the US on this. And also what about vermicompost use? Great presentations, thanks a lot, he says. So maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should, should I answer this question? Mm -hmm. of, um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, of course, it is. Uh, there, there are uh, there are uh, requirements and rules in the biocyclic vegan standard, uh, which deal with this topic. Uh, of course, in order to grow your vegetables, you have or whatever uh, crop, uh, you have to protect them against um, attacks by 
insects or other uh, other animals. Um, but uh, when you read the, the requirements, you will see that uh, this is the end of a chain of action which is necessary. So every disease and every pest is uh, 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 is a signal of an unbalanced situation. This might be occurring um, uh, in a normal way, also in nature, but uh, if it is becoming dangerous for the farmer, we have to react in some way. Uh, the first reaction we have to think about is to create conditions where the plants will not be affected by pests or, um, uh, or other diseases. Uh, this is very easy to uh, fight against um, for, uh, the, the, um, with fungi. So in bicyclic vegan farming systems, um, we see that the need of um, uh, pesticides uh, against fungi is much, much less. I will, maybe there is a chance to explain it afterwards, uh, uh, why is that? Because this has to do with the situation in the soil. Our, our main, uh, our main uh, issue is to, um, to enhance soil life, to restore uh, soil, uh, natural soil fertility. This is the first, ever first step we have to think about uh, when we are talking about uh, diseases and, and pests. Uh, the issue with the animals is another issue because animals flying, animals flying insects are coming into our cultivations from outside. And uh, as an organic producer, we cannot um, uh, protect ourselves. We cannot, um, we cannot grow under a, under a roof uh, or so. So um, we have to find the most natural way, and this is described in the in the in the standard. So there's a question for me. I'm not going from Rebecca. Rebecca, I'm not going to answer fully now because we're already behind schedule. Um, but I just want to mention, so her question is, how do you suggest approaching large vegan outreach uh, groups? Um, they might think it's a step too far. Uh, we'll put people going off vegan, do it to expense or an availability. Um, so I'm, I haven't read your whole question and I'm not going to answer it entirely. Maybe this is something that we could go more into at a future webinar. I do want to say something in respect to that, though, is that um, there's been a problem with the animal rights world where the focus is almost entirely on the consumer and not on organizing, not on grassroots movements, not on you know, policy and so on and so forth. And so when you speak about veganics, even if you're not at all talking about um, the consumer and what choices a consumer should make, that's the assumption that people make. Um, and I think that's really where the, the issue is, that some of what we're talking about and trying to do really is not about what people should buy in a store at all. Um, but I think the focus is so much about that, that that's the assumption often. Um, um, so, yeah, I think I think our organizing needs to be in a different way. I know that that doesn't really entirely answer the question, but I wanted to make that comment. Um, I'm going to read a question by Greg Lytus. I hope he doesn't mind me saying something about him. So Greg Lytus, uh, you know, has a whole I think he's an agronomist. Um, he used to uh, be a gardener at Animal Place. He would maintain a veganic garden there years ago and um he was the first veganic grower that i spoke with he was very generous when i was trying to get things going with we'll the commons and i really felt like this is such an urgent issue that we need to be putting forth veganics um i contacted them and he very generously spent i think it was definitely more than three hours it might have been four hours on the phone with me and just explaining uh things regarding veganic growing so um so he's done a lot for the movement and I really appreciate that. So his question is, how does the biocyclic vegan standard work with the stock-free organic standard in Great Britain? I think Johannes, you can say something about it. No, 
No, I, I think Axel, you you should uh, answer it. <laughs> okay, yeah, great. <laughs> no, I mean we are uh, we we met the, the people from the vegan uh, stock free organic movement. We are working very closely together because in a way we share the same principles. We have the same ideals in the background, and. Uh, we are also working together to organize a conference, a uh, Grow Green conference with some other associations from Europe uh, in front uh, towards the European Parliament. So we have a very, very close co cooperation. Uh, and still, we have a different uh, technical approach uh, just in the respect of uh, the standard, because the bicycle vegan standard is this uh, standard which is can be certified, which can be used on a large scale uh, by official certifying bodies and the certifying system with the uh, stock-free organic standard is a bit different. So these two movements have grown uh, in parallel separately, share the same principles, but technically there are some different uh, aspects maybe to say. All right, I'm going to read um, two questions at once for either Axel or Johannes. One question is, how many years of no animal inputs does the bicyclic vegan standard require? And then the other question is, um, well, first great presentation, very inspiring. What do Axel and Johannes think about the future breakthroughs they would like to see in the bicyclic vegan farming um, in terms of few further optimizing performance, particularly in terms of soil, landscape, media, the ecosystem services to society, and also in terms of avoiding insect pests, diseases, and weeds. Did you get both of those questions? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good questions. Very good questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Axel, start and I will continue. Go, go, go ahead, because I, I, I had to listen to too many aspects now. I think you got them and <laughs> I went too quick okay. at the time. Okay. Um, so the first question was a very precise question uh, to answer. Um, we consider that it is necessary the last use of animal, um, uh, animal uh, uh, origin inputs uh, has to be for the, uh, for the uh, cultivation before what is now being harvested. <laughs> Try to say it a little bit as uh, more simple. Um, the crop you want to harvest, at to, you want to, to get uh, bicyclic vegan certified has not to be fertilized with animal inputs. So the, uh, the year before that could be, have been done uh, still uh, uh, animal fertilization, um, but uh, and even that, uh, pro probably there is a, a part of this animal fertilizer still available in the soil, but somewhere we have to make a cut. The cut is uh, the, 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 the day when the farmer decides to become biocyclic vegan. So from this day on, whatever he plants and wants to grow has not to be fertilized with animal fertilizers anymore. So there is no trend, if it is an organic farm already, there is no transition period. So you can uh, decide now to produce biocyclic vegan products. You cannot sell whatever is on your farm, but you can sell whatever has been grown without the help of uh, animal uh, fertilizers. And other. And it, it's not only fertilizer, there, is, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, inputs uh, derived from animal materials, but also in sprains or others, it's not only fertilizer. So, uh, I if it is clear, otherwise we could go to the second part of the question. Um, okay. Um, the second uh, question gives me the opportunity to tell you something very, very basic. Um, the great breakthrough, uh, what was mentioned, uh, will be done when we have created a critical amount of what we call humus soil. Let me just uh, point out some, some words about that. Um, we think that to restore soil, soil life and natural soil fertility is done in the best way by uh, adding organic matter to the soil. Um, this can be done in several forms um, and methods. Uh, one is mulching, another one is um, uh, leguminous uh, green green manure and another thing is uh, composting and uh, 
we had the chance in the last years to observe that if you are cultivating on a ripe and uh, nutrient-stabilized compost for many years, this compost turns into something totally different than it was at the beginning. And the characteristics of this material are so different from a normal compost um, that uh, we had to find a new expression at the, and we called it now humus soil, which is also already a term used by scientific research. Um, the, the main characteristic of this material, which sometimes has been a good compost just, uh, is that the high content of nutrients is not water soluble anymore. And on the other hand, um, the availability of these nutrients is so high for the plants as it would be a fertilizer. So by using this material, we don't pollute anymore the underground water horizon. Um, there is no danger of over fertilization of burning seedlings or young plants. And even there is no danger of getting lost of the material. On the other hand, this material is a huge, um, uh, huge uh, deposit of nutrients and of carbon. It's a carbon sink because the carbon bound in this material cannot be degraded anymore my, uh, by microbes and is not anymore, um, uh, doesn't diffuse into the, uh, into the environment either by losses uh, through water or air. So uh, uh, by using this material, you will, and this is the, um, the research which has been done in Athens, you will recognize that the yields of the plants which are growing in this material are surpassing the average yield of a conventionally grown plant. You will observe that the root system will be twice or even three times bigger than of a normal plant. And you will uh, recognize that the shape of the plants is quite different what what you thought this plant could develop. So we live uh, this every day. This is, um, this is not a theory. This is an experience, an everyday experience, especially here in Kalamata, where we have a compost plant and we are uh, uh, performing uh, trial plantations with uh, different cultures on this material. And really, believe me, it's every day and every year a new ex uh, you, um, uh, surprise to see what nature really does. Um, and uh, the interesting thing is that every kind of plant reacts the same way uh, if it is grown in the human soil. Even if it is a wild plant or wild, wild herbs, which normally do not react positively to any kind of fertilization, or it is a hybrid vegetable, high yield uh, plant, all plants show the same behavior. And this has to do with a very, very basic thing. And this brings us back to the basics of organic farming in general. We have to keep in mind that in nature, there are two different ways how a plant can be nourished. Uh, the one is to absorb wa water. This is done by osmotic um, procedures. And it's a kind of passive way of getting the material inside because it needs it to to survive. The other one is, the, uh, is a whole set of mechanisms which are necessary for the plant to absorb non-water soluble nutritional elements from the soil, from its surrounding. Uh, this is what is every, uh, it's evident in nature. Just imagine a natural ecosystem where we know that in natural ecosystems, we have pure water quality. We don't have any pollution of the um, groundwater and uh, uh, the, the plants are healthy and are growing. So how can a plant grow uh, without water soluble elements? And it's something which will um, keep us researching for the next decades uh, in, um, in agricultural sciences to investigate even more in detail, the real relevant mechanisms, how plant nutrition is going on. We are very, very much um, misleaded, I would say, 
by the fact that the plant can absorb nutritional elements passively without any possibility to select by getting by, by drinking water, by, by being irrigated. So whatever you solve in the water, it will be absorbed by the plant and there is no mechanism to, 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 cho to choose. Whereas the plant can choose and chooses what it needs according to its development stage when it is forced to absorb nutritional elements in, a in an environment which does not give uh, which has which, uh, where, where there are no water soluble nutritional elements. So this is the reason why in organic farming um, we normally it's it's considered not to use water soluble nutrition nutritional elements in general. And when you've seen now to organic practice uh, nowadays, you will find a lot of fertilizers which are really water soluble, and um, it's more or less. Um, a change of um, synthetic fertilizers to natural fertilizers, but they, if they are still water soluble. Johanna, sorry, but we're going to need to get to the end of this segment soon. This was a kind of a question I saw in the in the questionnaire um, about this, the connection to the fertilizing industry. It's very interesting. So, all right. So thank you so much to all three of you. I really, really appreciate that you were able to be here. And thank you to everyone who's stuck around. So the first topic um, I'd really like for this first segment to specifically invite the participation of people who are already uh, veganic farmers or um, veganic growers who are involved in food based movements and communities. Um, and of course, also, uh, I invite the three panelists to also uh, give their opinions. Um, but we'd like to invite your experiences and perspectives on, um, you know, the barriers that you face, both as people who are already veganic farmers, um, and what you think would allow um, more ease and a growth of uh, the veganic farming movement. So, you know, what would support look like from the non-farmers? What would make it easier? Um, and then also if people have experience with um, entry barriers as people who are not yet farmers, perhaps young farmers who are studying or something like that. Um, and the panelists are also welcome to speak a little bit about their experiences with that and um, you know how uh, what they've heard from the people they work with um, about um, you know the, the challenges in interfacing with consumers but also with the broader farming community with other organic farmers and so on. So we'll um, you know as Chema said uh, I think the system is that you can raise your hand, you can type in like a little snippet, like three, four words, a sentence about who you are, what your contribution is about, and then we'll um, promote people to panelists. So I see here, uh, Shannon Thomas uh, raised her hand. So I'm gonna uh, put in there, allow to talk. Hi there, and you can have video if you want. I don't know how to do that on my end because I'm actually working on the farm right now with with my farm team. So, oh, let let I me let me actually do that. Give me one okay. second. And it's okay if you can't. You can go ahead and start speaking. Yeah, right? yeah, we could talk. Um, Okay, all right, so sorry, it's a little cold out today. Um, well, uh, we're in uh, Arizona and uh, Mesa outside of Phoenix, um, but uh, we've been uh, growing veganically since I moved to this property, which was uh, 2008 uh, fall is when we started. Um, but for us, we sell to uh, local restaurants, um, also the farmer's market. And to be honest with you guys, like it's been a non-issue. Uh, we haven't had any, no one's come up to us. And this is like, like Arizona, like red Arizona, you know what I mean? So um, it's pretty conservative and uh, totally cattle country and corn and cotton and all that. So 
um, it's been uh, nothing but support uh, for us, even from um, other organic farmers. My teacher actually that I studied under was an organic farmer and he knew what my goal was to transition um, and it's nothing but supportive. And he refers other um, people that want to learn to me. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that when I first started in my head, I thought it was going to be a lot of problems, issues, people rolling their eyes or, you know, stuff like that, you know, kind of like when people find out, um, if you eat a certain way, right. They just want to, whatever, preach to you about whatever. So, and we have, we've had nothing like that. So our, our customers, um, there are vegans and vegan or vegan restaurants that seek us out. But the majority of our customers are just the general public. Um, and like I said, it's been nothing but a warm reception. And the reason why I think too, because our stuff tastes different. It really does. Bottom line, um, there's something special about growing uh, without manure and without animal products. And, um, and I won't take up all the time, but for, for me, like in your head, if you haven't started farming yet or haven't started selling to the general public, um, you may be like me that it was it was really uh, a non-issue that I didn't know until we did it right you don't know until you know and uh, it's been a wonderful thing and and actually the city here or the city we live in has approached us um, we're going to be expanding they actually are going to give us um, some city land to, to expand our farm so um, yeah so anyway but so just do it you know um, right here is just a half acre. I, I started at my house because we didn't have the funds to get land, but now the city's offered it. So, you know, so just go for it. And um, anyway, so I hope there's other people in Arizona. So please contact me. I would love to get a group together that, so we could do this together. That's it. <laughs> that, that's wonderful. Oh, quick, quick question. Thank, thank no, no. Chama. Yes. Quick, quick yes. question for uh, Shannon. Um, Kamal was asking, do you market your um, products as organic or is that as organic? Have you? I do. Yep. Um, and we don't say like, there's no certification. So we don't say we're certified or anything, but um, we uh, at the farmer's market stand, um, we have our farm name and, and in it is Veganic Farm, you know, and, and on Instagram, uh, we also have, you know, veganic farming in the city is, is our like tagline. And I just have an explanation like veganic equals organically grown without animal byproducts and sustainable farming methods. So, you know what I mean? So, so they know what we are, what we're about, what we do. And again, it's just, I'm blown away actually, because we hid out for a couple years and just did CSAs and and the vegan cafes, you know, so this year, January is when we first just ventured out. And like I said, it's been crazy gangbusters. And, and like I said, last month, the, the city came to us. So it's just, uh, yeah. So like I said, just, you know, we don't know until we know. So go for it. Just go for it. Just do it. You know, so. Oh, what do I grow? Someone's asking me. Uh, right now we're transitioning. I, I think we need to, unfortunately, I okay, think we yeah, need to, to move to the next. Everything. We grow everything seasonally. So multi-crops. All right. That's it. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So we have Melissa Hoffman who has her uh, hand up. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for hosting this. Uh, Nassim and, and everyone for your presentations. And uh, I wanted to add a few things. I'm a, a veganic, well, I'm a vegan grower on 1300 acres in Vermont. And I run a sanctuary as well with my wife. Um, and we have been incorporating sanctuary compost here and there, but I really believe in doing a full on pure veganic approach just to prove the concept and just attended a six part course um, uh, put on by Dalhousie University, uh, and it was with Helen Atow, and it was so enlightening and so needed and so um, perfect for what this movement needs, which is the grounding in data and, and practice, uh, and also uh, the open-ended need for ongoing research. I just wanted to add a few things. I think 
from my experience as a, I'm also a chef and food innovator. Um, and my goal is to use wild perennial and annual. We're gonna expand into a small scale uh, annual CSA on our farm. Um, given a, a grant from NRCS um, for a greenhouse, for a high tunnel. So we're really excited about that. So Monica, I really resonated with the, your punch list about how to, things that we could look at to uh, enhance the movement. And Shannon just mentioned one of them. And I really wanted to emphasize this as a chef, the flavor of veganics is amazingly something that we should put up front and center because people will self-centeredly, self-interestedly, and chefs will latch on to that feature. Um, there's already a, a, a very famous uh, cannabis grower named Kyle Cushman, and you may have heard of all the Kush, K-U-S-H, uh, varieties of cannabis out there if you're in that world at all. But he recently um, launched a whole veganic line and is extolling the benefits of growing cannabis veganically because of the clean flavors and how much more pure the flavors are. And I just wanted to, I'm excited about that as a chef and as a feature, and it's also my experience. It's not just the flavors, it's the aromatics of, of, of food and any herbs or herb that one might be growing. That that is not something to ignore in, in how we promote veganics. Along with that, as Helen Altau just uh, presented in her series, is that there's a higher phytonutrient content she often finds in her or nutrient density in the, in the crops because there's a there's a gravitation away from adding water soluble nitrogen, which makes big fluffy health, you know fat, juicy, healthy looking plants. But in reality, it's just adding salt to the soil, to the, to the vascular plants water uptake that then requires the plant to add, uh, to add extra water to the tissue to make the tissue look bigger. It doesn't necessarily make the nutrient density any better. So I think there's a phytonutrient load, a nutrient density improvement, and as well as an aromatic and uh, flavor um, improvement. And I think, I know that Nassim, you, you suggested we shouldn't be appealing to the consumer end of things as much, but I think that to do crossover marketing, when, when, when we're marketing outside of our own value set and our own ethical value set, um, that's really important to do just to say, look, it tastes better. Look, it's better for you. It's more nutrient dense. And to develop the arguments, the infographics, and the data to use that in our marketing. Um, so that's my main point. And this sub point I just wanted to, to share is that you know we're going to be offering our little CSA to animal advocates and the people we know who are always working tirelessly to advocate for animals, um, both wildlife and farmed animals. Um, and there's a great crossover, I think, in that marketing campaign so that veganics can appeal to those who are, are who don't need to be educated. Um, and, but, well, actually they do need to be educated. Did you know that the vegetables you buy in the store often use slaughterhouse byproducts? Well, if, if you don't want that, then here, here's some veganics. It's very simple. It's a low hanging fruit in our marketing world. So working with wildlife advocates animal rights organizations in the veganics, um, we're finding that that's, you know, it's a slow building of the movement. It's a slow building of the market share, but it is growing so fast. And all it takes is the kind of work that you guys are doing to, to bring that knowledge to people who already care. And that's to me, the low hanging fruit and how we grow the movement. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I actually want to add something because you said uh, you opened up to a, a topic we had planned also for this town hall. Um, no, actually, one of the topics that are planned for this town hall is the role of consumers, because I do think that for this specific uh, moment and movement, um, they can play a big role. What I meant regarding the role of consumers in the vegan world and veganics and how some people kind of are like, oh, that's too much, um, is more in the sense of uh, the idea that 
individual consumers should go out now with an additional thing like okay well i'm not supposed to have milk and no egg and no less of them and then now i also have to worry about not buying this and that and so when it's put on the individual like that um understandably people think that that's overwhelming um and also uh generally speaking i think that social change is not really made through this kind of like shop with your dollar thing but I do think that in the case of the veganic movement at this point in time, consumers do actually have a very big role to play. But there's a big difference between creating consumer demand um, and you know, putting the onus on individual people who don't have access to things to tell them, well, now you're wrong when you go and buy your organic vegetables and you're doing something ethically wrong. So I don't think that the latter message is helpful. But I do think that consumers um, can play a big role right now. And that's actually something we wanted to talk about because I think it's a really exciting, um, you know, it's a really exciting place where growth can can happen now is that consumers can have that power. Um, but I don't know if we should move on to that topic now or if anybody has, you know, hands raised if they want to stay with um, the previous topic. I'm trying to see. Um, I I saw uh, Johan uh, has raised his hand. Okay. Yeah, it, it just uh, maybe just to uh, the point uh, that Melissa Hoffman uh, told us, um, uh, it has to make a click in the mind of the people exactly on this point that uh, just to have a vegan product, when you go into the supermarket, you, you will see a huge range of vegan products. They're just called vegan. And when they are um also organic certified they are organic and vegan and maybe some people call it ve uh, veganic uh, even if it is not um, the term as it should be used at this moment and uh, so we made a small film um uh, with biofach maybe you know the international uh, trade fair for organic products biofach which is also in america and in europe and so and the, the last biofach was uh, organized um, virtually and uh, we created a small film just uh, um, addressing this point uh, that people should think about the salad which is a plant how could a salad be vegan if it is not grown in a veganic way so uh, this is uh, just to add to, uh, this information there uh, we have to make a, a, um, a campaign it has to be a, a form of campaign i think uh, to 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 address people um, at this point, which which is the crucial point to understand what we mean with with the term veganic or bicyclic vegan. Thank you for that. I just want to take a short little uh, an opportunity to uh, let you all know that uh, you know we we love holding events like this. We want to continue holding events like this. Uh, definitely consider uh, making a small donation. I'll, I put the link on the website and it's just seedthecommons.org slash uh, support. So uh, Nassim, I'll pass it on to you. I, I think there's somebody else who All right. Um, so just one question sabrina are you a farmer were you going to speak to the first initial point or more to the later points um i think you're unmuted oh hi um hi i'm actually i work with shannon in arizona and on her veganic farm in eco suburbia and I had more of a, a point regarding um, aspiring veganic farmers and the topic that we dis discussed earlier regarding normalizing veganic structures. And um, while there are certain networks that exist um, that their previous panelists have outlined and I've personally searched for, um, I find that a lot of time and energy of at least prospective veganic growers is wasted in traditional education systems that support this false or more traditional sense of what sustainable agriculture is. And there's this huge lack of opportunity for the veganic movement to consolidate a wide array of growing veganically. So if it is like our panelists mentioned, 
you know, more of like a monoculture uh, or permaculture or food forests or urban biointensive market gardens. Um, that principle, that overlying principle that can orient us towards growing veganically is missing from almost from most, if not all, local education structures. So the largest, I guess, hurdle and wasted time and energy for people getting off the ground who are ethically uh, vegan or reaching other like animal liberation activists is that I don't think that there's an avenue, an easily accessible avenue not to, to not only retrain yourself to um, tap into this regenerative soil health um, sort of approach to our agriculture systems, um, which is highlighted really wonderfully uh, by Helen Atten, uh, by Helen, uh, who's gonna be your next panelist uh, next uh, over the next Veganic Revolution um, meeting you're, you're throwing. But I, I just feel like if there is an opportunity to have these, this network of training within either regionally, um, or just somewhere that's outlined, it could be such a wonderful network of engaging these people who really thoroughly want to devote themselves to this movement, but there's just a lack of, of support or it has to be sought out for. And um, I, I know personally there, there's, there's some moral, um, it, it kind of forces you into this section where you want to learn at least most of the elements of sustainable agriculture, but then the veganic is missing. So there's not much point in putting your efforts there and you have to amend what you learned um, from your different experience. So um, yeah, I guess I'm just trying to say that if we're really trying to normalize veganic uh, agriculture, creating that network either locally, regionally, um, nationwide for people to really come and train and apprentice because those are certainly available for more traditional agriculture or even sort of the greenwashing, um, you know, non-veganic ways of growing. And, and to have that would just be such a game changer. Right on. And, and that's exactly our perspective as well, that, that we need to start building uh, this movement up and finding ways to support uh, not just uh, current farmers, but uh, farmers who are aspiring right, uh, to, to do that. And, and that requires, uh, well, uh, events like this, right? Uh, I saw somebody else that had their hand up. Uh, oh, I guess uh, they took it down. Um, any, anybody else have anything to say on this uh, topic of supporting farmers? If you're a farmer uh, that wants to give some feedback, best ways to support you and your work. So yes, the next subject uh, is actually something a little bit related to, to what was being talked about just a second ago. Uh, and, and this is actually uh, really relevant because ultimately we need to talk about the way we get public funding and support, right? Uh, what strategies we can use to get that government support, right? Uh, Shannon mentioned, for example, this question of getting land. So it can be a question of policy. It can be a question of funding. It could be a question of addressing subsidies. And it can be at a question of local, regional, national, and of course, international level, right? I really would like to dig deep into this, try to find ways that we can all work together to, to get that public support. Uh, before we open it up to uh, the uh, speak to the attendees, uh, Axel, Johannes, or Mona, do you have any thoughts on this uh, question? On the question of Great. generating support, um, like public support for Veganic? Um, uh, public, public funding, uh, governmental support specifically. Um, yeah, you know, actually, Shannon has just popped something into the, the chat about um, USDA grants. Um, Alicia and I were recently discussing this as well, um, the potential for something like SARE through the USDA to, um, or to develop a, a specific veganic funding program parallel to that, um, or something like a, a research foundation for veganic farming, um, but in uh, you know, that's a, like the Organic Farming Research Foundation is a nonprofit, it's not um, a public institution, but um, those are a couple ideas that are, that came up in, in our discussions lately, so I'll put those on the table um, right now. 
may, maybe from my side, uh, some of our experience is also if we want to address politics, uh, it, it's a long process and it requires what I said also in my presentation, it, uh, it requires certain visibility and also scientific support because whenever you want something from government they ask you what is the scientific evidence what what how can you back this and i think uh, it, it it it's the process we are working on from our side uh, to get all these elements and it's interesting you know the better we manage to communicate the advantages and benefits of biopsychic vegan farming we see uh, the more it spreads into uh, the public awareness and suddenly you see popping up some that it's mentioned somewhere like we had some reports we report of the very important advisory serve, uh, advisory board of the uh, government of the federal government in germany and suddenly they have a report about climate sensitive agriculture and they say oh vegan uh, biocycle vegan agriculture is a new approach so the, suddenly they mention it in their report and this is a big success we didn't even know that suddenly we discovered it and so uh, there is another uh, example where also in, uh, there was a study about the different niches in the food system which have the potential for uh, transformation. And then suddenly you find a chapter about bicyclic vegan farming saying this is one of the niches which are there today which have a very strong potential. And so people read it, they hear about it, and suddenly someone else picks it up, puts it into his article. So that's the way it's, it's like, we know how viruses work now. It's contagious. And in a way we should use these same principles for our work. And of course, it's important to share as much as possible, like in our meeting today, our different experiences, bring together the scientists from different areas that they publish, that they write articles about it. I think we need the press, we need, just we need the media to to talk about it and this will address also politics and for instance that's what we have also started to work on with the vegan organic network from the uk and other associations uh, as i said in brussels we are planning a big conference now um, in begin the first of june and second of june it was to be it was meant to be a, a normal conference but we are going to do it now as a virtual conference as well where we address all these all these items and we will talk about european agriculture politics and uh, we will have we will invite people from the european parliament european commission and from the different agricultural uh, organic movements so there is something uh, we try to do and it is right we have to work together on different levels nationally regionally but also internationally and it's a process, it's a long process, but I feel uh, there is something ripening already and we will get there. So uh, people would like to know more about the conference. So um, I just want to invite Axel, perhaps send us the information later and we'll share it with our followers um, so that they can come there. Um, sorry, I had just, just one thing with the conference. It's not yet online. We don't have the website yet, but uh, I will say I will put the link uh, in the in the chat. And it's still the old Grow Green conference, which used to be, which was 2019 in London. But this is a new international one, and I put the link in the in the chat. I look. I'm looking for. So, uh, I would yeah. like to to add something to what Axel said. Um, uh, we consider that even the certification system itself by using the label could be a source of funds for the movement and for the um, uh, for the producers because um, the right to use the label is combined with a system fee with a label fee and since uh, as axel told you uh, axel hopes uh, um, Adolf Hoops Gesellschaft uh, is um, a non-for-profit organization. It receives these fees in order to redistribute the funds to the grassroots organizations, to the producers, to the projects, and to the um, to the uh, uh, to the extension services. Uh, technical advice for the producers, which is uh, something which is very necessary in order to grow the movement because it grows if there is availability of product. 
um, if the if we it's growing without having uh, enough products, uh, it cannot grow. So it's something of which is going step by step. So you have to have products, then it grows by the awareness of the of the consumers. And another thing is that we are planning to launch a fund uh, based on biocyclic humus soil. Um, so this could be an instrument for somebody who wants to um, invest his money in something uh, sustainable, in something which is not related to any financial transactions uh, in, the, in the other economic system. And um, this, uh, this money could be used to enhance and to support economically uh, compost plants either by producers themselves or uh, by professional compost plants, which have to be supported in order to produce out of the compost what we, uh, what I told you is the humus soil, which is a very, very central point in the whole development. So these two, two axes, um, by selling products, getting funds and by um, collecting funds for helping the production, this could shift the movement up i think thank you for that uh, i i i see some hands raised and the seam is getting back up. all right so sorry i had some technical issues um it happens uh, i know that mona needs to leave very soon so you know maybe she'll have something to say about my next kind of question prompt um and then other people also but mona you had mentioned that it seemed that the the challenges facing veganic farmers in your research were really very largely the same challenges facing other small farmers and we're not specific to veganics um and we spoke a little bit about like public funding and these sorts of things so i'm wondering if you and others also um you know perhaps from experience or in your case just the discussions you've had um you know what are your thoughts on the veganic farming movement, or at least some parts of it, some individuals in it, being rooted in other movements, such as, for example, um, you know, in the United States, we have the Food Sovereignty Alliance, like all these different uh, movements of organic farmers, small farmers, etc., cetera, um, who are addressing these issues around, for example, land access or all the other things that affect small farmers. Um, you know, how important would it be for the veganic farming movement to be part of that? And if so, would it be an easy thing to achieve? Like, you know, yeah. Okay, um, I can try to provide some some thoughts on this. Um, yeah, just to just to clarify, I mean, there there are some major veganic challenges that most of our participants reported. Um, but my point there was that everyone also has these additional challenges of simply being a small farmer or an ecologically oriented farmer um, who's not growing commodity crops. Uh, you know, we didn't have um, great discussion in our interviews uh, about other movements that the farmers are associated with, but it does seem to make sense to, um, you know, be part of several movements or several organizations um, dealing with veganics and also um, other small farmer issues. That said, uh, you know, time is a big concern. And, um, you know, I can't sit here and say that um, any uh, veganic farmer should join another movement or, or should um, spend their time organizing for an additional movement if they're even able to organize for this one. So I'm not really comfortable saying that, but um, I think we can say that um, veganic farmers face issues that other movements need to approach. I don't know if that's a helpful comment, Nassim, but kind of where I'm left at. Yeah, I guess I'm wondering, like, for example, I know that Alicia is very involved, um, or at least I think she is, um, you know, as an agroecology student and locally in the sort of local um, kind of farmers associations or that sort of thing. And one of the speakers we had had the first year in the People's Harvest Forum was very involved locally in um, organizing around food sovereignty in the United Kingdom. And so I guess I'm, I'm kind of thinking 
thinking about going forth as the farmers, but also those of us who are kind of supporting that and trying to organize around that, to what extent do we need to and, and how to integrate that and kind of remain true to it or get support from it, also support it. That's, I guess that's the kind of coordination that I'm trying to think of. And if this is, you know, something that I think is um, perhaps even necessary to maintaining kind of an ecological approach, or if we're not addressing those things, are we really not doing justice to the veganic farmers at the end of the day? Basically that kind of coordination between the other larger land-based small farming movements. Um, I don't know if there are people maybe here who already have that kind of experience of being in both worlds. Um, I know that some of the veganic farmers who, who follow us do tend to kind of live in, those, in both of those worlds so I don't know if anyone's here today and would like to comment, um, yeah, or if anyone has any other thoughts. Yeah, I agree. That would be really interesting because I know that there's at least one person here who has a foot in veganics and also a foot in regenerative, and that must be some sort of a balancing act, as some of the participants have pointed out through the comments. So there's one, I don't know if Renee was going to speak on that or on something else. Um, Hey, I just wanted to, to say I'm, um, I'm out here in my husband's um, garden and we're doing everything that um, we can out here to create a, um, uh, a veganic uh, garden. You know, we're really working diligently to make uh, great strides in that way. And so he happens to be out here working. We endured the big Texas blizzard a few weeks ago and I can't believe how good our garden looks, even after all that. And so I just thought I'd, uh, since he's out here, see if uh, y'all like to, um, I mean, I could introduce him and maybe, um, you know, he could ask some questions and we could get some help for ourselves out here. We used to be a cattle ranch, you know, like on one side of the, on one side of the veganic garden is uh, all the cows and on the other side is our garden. We took no animal inputs, uh, in this soil. And so, um, you know, we're doing everything we can. I'm sure we can always do better. And so that's why I'm here to learn more and to collaborate uh, with those uh, that can also help us in, uh, you know, in our initiatives, specifically the Rancher Advocacy Program. But I just wanted to show you what we're doing out here and see if you wanted to, or see if my husband wanted to chat and y'all wanted to meet him. Uh, I mean, if you can, you know, if it's going to be like one or two minutes, that would be okay. But, um, but if not, we would have to do that for another webinar because we do have uh, several questions we wanted to approach and we only have uh, about 25 minutes left for that. Oh, no, it's whatever. I just, I just happen to be out here. He happens to be out here. It won't, I mean, I don't need a lot of yeah. time. I'm not asking for um, a lot of time. That's all. Okay. And so we're out here uh, in my husband's um, garden, in our garden. And if I, I'll put the, uh, here, here's Tommy over there. There he is. I don't know what he's doing exactly, but uh, I think he's working on our water lines that got busted during the freeze. Tommy, you want to say hi? Hello. This is my husband, Tommy, former cattle rancher that now, uh, you know, goes hunting for um, for relics and also, you know, loves uh, to do farming um, as veganically as we know how to do out here. Uh, like I said, this is uh, this is where we are right now and what we're doing here. And Tommy, what do, you're wanting to like uh, eventually get this to a place where we can actually make money for the sanctuary too, right? Yeah. Veganic gardening is new to me. I'm not putting anything in here, uh, although it started out as just ranch land. So I don't know how long it takes to be veganic, considered veganic, but uh, certain crops are growing real good and certain crops uh, aren't growing so good. Uh, the main thing I need to come up with is a uh, system uh, to put back on the you know, the crops that need more. Some of the crops don't need more. Some of them are doing just fine in this soil, but you know, you want to continuously build your soil up. And uh, the potatoes are doing great. We planted them before the freeze. Uh, 
I just need them right here, Renee. And uh, we got a whole bunch of them. They uh, they survived the ice, but they were underground before the freeze. Uh, the onions got sent a lot. And, uh, we have a lot of onions. Renee, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on because um, if not, we're going to go too, no, too I late. I appreciate it. I just thought, you know, it would be awesome for you guys to see that we're doing everything we can out here. And I appreciate the work you're doing so much, Nassim. Likewise, likewise. And maybe next time you can come on and, and show us more about uh, the farming that you're doing. Thank you. Oh. And we have another person uh, who is going to go on uh, video. So this is Yvonne. Yeah. Can you see me? Yes. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Yvonne Werner and I'm the chair of the Agricultural Plant Based Society at the uh, Faculty of Agriculture at the Dalhousie uh, University in Nova Scotia, Canada. And I started a plant-based club here on campus because we have no information at all about organic agriculture, stocky organic farming. It was basically told it's too difficult, it can't be done. And I was really bothered by that. So I started this club and we just had this serious hotel in Artau and we had Ian Tallest in fall. And I just think we need to stop uh, now we need to create opportunities for young people to hear about veganic and stock free organic farming so my appeal to veganic farmers everywhere in the world would be first get on the roof sites i don't know if everyone knows about worldwide opportunities on organic farms it's a website we have one in the us and one in canada i'm pretty sure there's one in europe where you can go on and just offer a free internship or even an internship where someone can earn a summer salary as an agricultural student or just an interested young person or person. I mean, I'm a mature student, for example. I would be interested in those opportunities and there's nothing around here. So if, if you're a veganic farmer, it's very, uh, very, very valuable for young people to see opportunities in veganic farming, to learn about veganic farming. So my first suggestion would be for all the veganic farmers to get on those sites and I can post them in the chat later. And the second one would be if you have an agricultural uh, campus near you and there is a plant-based society and I know of other plant-based societies and vegan societies at uh, universities, offer them to come in and to tell about your way of farming. So we really need to spread this message to young people. And I think that would be a huge multiplier because these young people, they're bombarded with the news of uh, regenerative grazing and about no organic is too complicated. So if we can just hold against that and say, here, we offer a free webinar for this university club or this agricultural faculty uh, in, in Germany, the, the Landwirtschaft. Ivan, I think you have some sound in the background. Uh, Yvonne, I think you have some sound in the background also okay, that's can you coming here. Clem, um, absolutely quiet. Is that better? Okay, that must have been my son. Eh? He was talking at the other side of the apartment. Um, I was trying to record yeah, a video. So I think those were interrupting. I, the, those two those two um, opportunities for young people would be super important to really um, multiply this knowledge transfer. Because the young people, they really have the problem. They hear every day these news at the university and it's basically read to them as if from a Bible. So if they don't check, fact check themselves, they believe that. I even had a plant science professor telling me that there's no risks in GMOs. Yeah, so if you are young people believing, then you might not look up the answers, the real answers. I had a professor telling me crop rotation in veganic farming is too complicated. So if we don't tell people that it's doable, successfully doable and profitable, they will not go there. And if you're a veganic farmer, just go out and go to the faculty, offer the club there, or even the faculty to hold um, just one webinar and offer the roofing. So I don't know if everyone knows about that. I can post it right here in the chat. This is the roofing site. 
Yeah, and we're going to have to to wrap up now for this question. But thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so I know that Mona needs to leave. Uh, thank you so much. I, sorry, I'm having some technical problems, but I think you guys can at least hear me. Um, maybe I'll actually stop my video. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful to participate today. I really appreciate you all doing this webinar series. Thank you. So I'm going to... I'm going to continue. I think that Yvonne's um, comments were really important. This is something that Mona has highlighted also, just the lack of educational opportunities. Um, this is something that we've noted a lot um, and people just need to find that information for themselves because there's so little available. And so I think that it's important, um, you know, it's great that there's this enthusiasm amongst vegans to help livestock farmers transition to veganics that's a big part that's important uh, but i think there are other things that are important as well one is supporting the people who are already veganic farmers um, in the bay area our working group on veganic farming that we founded a few years ago um, was a group of farmers and activists and one of the farmers got the idea to launch a csa um, and it was great it was a great project but it lasted two or three years because financially they could um, even the local vegans community didn't, you know, even the, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Even the local com vegan community wasn't supportive enough to keep them financially um, afloat. And so that's one important thing, the veganic farmers who are also doing it. And then another important thing are the people, the young people who are becoming farmers now and they have, they're facing so many issues such as land access and so on. But one of those issues is lack of information and training opportunities. So these are all things that I think the movement really needs to think about. One of the things that inspires me um, because I, I spent a lot of time volunteering for Via Campesina seeing how they do farmer to farmer training. They have agroecological schools with farmer to farmer training. And I think it would be very inspiring to see um, vegan agroecological training programs that are farmer to farmer. Um, I'll start my video again. So I know that people are getting tired. Um, there were two other topics that I wanted to bring up. Um, I don't know if, you know, we'll try to do five minutes each. Um, and people who have experience maybe with this, who've thought about it, you know, I encourage you to raise your hand. So one of those issues is, or questions in terms of growing the veganic movement is international solidarity and organizing. So, you know, already here we're bringing together um, North America with Europe, which isn't really just Europe, right? You guys have, uh, you're, you're working already with people around the world. Um, and so how can we think or should we think and how um, around solidarity? Uh, so I should support my local veganic farmer, but maybe I should also think about how can I help support other people? Uh, how can I help them transition? How can I, you know, support the movement in broader ways? Um, and also, I think organizing at an international level. So um, something that I wanted to mention to people in terms of the work of See the Commons is that what we would really like to do in this respect is um, so I didn't mention that the very first thing we did when Seed the Commons was founded in 2009 was that we went up to Copenhagen for COP15. So the Conference of the Parties, it's the climate summit that the UN organizes. And so I was there partially volunteering with Via Campesina, Chemo was there partially helping out another group, but we also um, went there as the comments to start spreading <laughs> veganics. Um, and so now, uh, 12 years later, we'd actually really like to be able to go to um, COP, uh, I can't remember what number it is this year. Um, it's going to be in Scotland. So if everything is back to normal in terms of COVID, we'd like to go there physically. And if not participate in other ways, we'd like to have a delegation there and present a position paper on a you know widespread um, transition to veganic farming. And and so our, you know, not everyone can do everything, not, not every organization can do everything. And that's something that we would like to be able to work on this year. Um, and so I wanted to mention that. And I wanted to say that if anybody here is part of an organization that would like to sign on and or help develop the position paper, please contact me, let me know. 
Um, if you're an individual who wants to volunteer and help, you know, there are lots of things to do there, be it research or other things, um, contact me and let me know. And if financially you'd like to help us make that possible, um, also that, you know, contact me and let me know <laughs> or already make a donation. Um, so, you know, so that's something that ideally we would have a lot of organizations sign on to. So that's my my vision in terms of what we can do at an international level, but I think a lot can be done. And I know that some of the people here already have um, experience working um, internationally. So I'm wondering what people have in mind. Do they have any ideas so far? And Axel and Johan, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do so. If anybody else wants to raise their hand, I'd be happy to uh, allow you to talk or uh, promote you to panelists so you can show your video. Uh, this is great. We're having a lot of conversations and I love the fact that we actually got on the field video from Texas and Arizona. It's exciting. I think there are some questions uh, which have not been answered. I don't know if it is the, now, the, the right time to do that now, or maybe there should be a possibility to answer really every question because I think they're all worth being answered. But maybe the time fr frame is not enough. Uh, well, if, if, the, if the topic of international solidarity and organizing is not something that um, elicits conversation, that's fine. There was one more topic that I did want to bring up, though, and then maybe after that we can do some FAQ for the people who are still here. Um, so the last topic that I wanted to bring up was actually something that others have mentioned, the role of consumers. Um, I think that this is one area, you know, as people know about See the Commons, we typically don't think you can save the world with your dollar. Having said that, I think that now we are at a point in time with this particular movement where a big problem is really that people just don't know about it. And I think that there is really um, a huge amount of potential for consumers to make a difference. And I'm wondering what your ideas are in terms of consumer involvement. Should there be consumer-led campaigns? You know, what, what can that look like? I think that this is really an area where, um, you know, the 79 participants here can actually make a difference because not all of us are farmers, not all of us are gonna go to COP or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that there is space for a lot of creativity here and how consumers can start um, really putting veganics out there. And I see I, Melissa has raised her. I, I have some ideas to, to answer that question, just to give in. Uh, I think, uh, t t according to my experience, uh, there is already existing a coalition between our uh, veganic, biocyclic vegan farmers and consumers, much more than it is visible. What we what we try to to realize is is uh, or to 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 uh, what we try to do is in a great extent what people want to see, and many people think of organic products more or less what we are doing in our work, everyday work in the in the fields. And also the examples which we could see in the um, now the contributions from the fields show me that this is exactly uh, what happens everywhere in the world. So I think we should address the consumer directly as as much as possible. Uh, for example, inviting them to visit farms, or as it is the um, uh, the uh, how is it called uh, the social social uh, based um, agriculture zola v uh, axel please help me how is it called in english csa okay CSA. CSA. community support agriculture yes yes mm -hmm. uh, there are some very good examples uh, i know where this works where people really bind themselves into the organic production and and uh, really help uh, the, the movement going on uh, so this is probably um to come back what Mona said at the beginning, there are so many similarities between the, uh, the just upcoming veganic movement and the organic movement uh, 50 years ago. Uh, when the number of organic farmers grew, uh, in, the, in, in Europe it was at the beginning of the 1980s, um, they tried to, to sell their produce and their products 
in the existing market channels. And this was not possible. Um, these market channels denied to, con to distribute these products. So they developed a known system, a new system, which is uh, called in, uh, in Germany, it's a health food shop system. Organic, uh, organic food stores. Yes, there are uh, big, uh, big uh, distributors uh, have arised just dedicated to organic. So mm -hmm. probably the veganic uh, biocyclic vegan movement has also to define new ways how to find uh, the consumers and probably um, uh, electronic ways of communication will help us. Maybe even in some years, uh, new ways of transportation will help us. Just imagine what it means when, when a package of, uh, of uh, products can travel um, directly to the consumer. I'm thinking about drones. Why not? It could happen. So uh, we can surpass huge barriers, huge um, uh, uh, um, obstacles by using maybe new technology in some years. We have to be uh, conscious that many, many people on the consumer side have exactly the same, same um, uh, uh, values, share our values and, and will support if, there, if there's something they can get together. Thank you for that. And I see uh, two hands up. Axel, you're on muted. Did you want to briefly say something? Uh, no, it's fine. It's fine. I just forgot to unmute. Okay, uh, Melissa, I'm gonna uh, turn on your uh, sound. Thank you. Um, I agree with Johannes too that the direct farmer to consumer educational pathway is incredibly important. And I used to run back in, in 1995, 96, I, I ran an organic farm CSA. Um, and it, it was incredibly successful. It's, it's, it's one of the most valuable pathways for education. But I think that <clears throat> I also agree with Johannes and that there's, uh, we're in a different era now where uh, we can amplify the authentic person to person voice and message across media, but it has to stay authentic and it has to stay, tr stay true and stay on point. Um, but, uh, and I will echo the point I made earlier that consumer education where people already are on board with the value proposition of veganic agriculture, but may not have, may never have heard of it before. So animal advocates, vegans who don't know anything about agriculture or land use or food systems that um, it's an invaluable service that we can develop together and I'm very marketing minded in in the way I form messages um, but we need to collaborate on that and, as a movement I think and if we can do that with very grounded data that also leverage existing buy-in and for example as Nassim knows this in the regenerative agriculture movement where people already care about ecosystems and storing carbon and soil health and and um, and, and habitat degradation, um, showing how veganic actually does those things, but even better. Um, it's packaging the data that are are out there, but obviously more need to come in. Um, and then to chefs, for example, the flavor is better. Um, phytonutrients are better potentially. And that's very, I'm, I'm hesitant to say in all cases, flavor is better. And in all cases, phytonutrients are better because we all know that every farm is a different ecosystem in a microclimate. So it's hard to, to make that claim without a qualification or the nuance and the subtlety that is part of our lives, which is, look, agriculture is part of a complex ecosystem. And the more complex the ecosystem, the more beneficial the products that come out of that ecosystem and potentially the more healthful to you, the more, um, the, the more flavorful. 
So there, there are so many different niches from the consumer to land use and how land is actually appropriated and used for the purposes of agriculture. For example, land sparing for wildlife and wild ecosystems can grow by, we can, we can use potentially uh, only less than 25% of the land currently used for agriculture if we go to a, a veganic system. So the land sparing implications are for wildlife and wild ecosystems are um, unparalleled. So we can leverage messaging in all of those different areas. And that's the, that's the beauty of this is that it's a systemic approach. So there's no one single message. It tastes better, yes. It's better for you, most often, yes. It, it's better for the land, yes. Uh, so kind of developing messaging across these different areas of expertise with people who know about it, I think is, is, is a, a really valuable thing we can do for consumers and for to, to educate our consumers so that they're going to seek out veganic growers, animal advocates in particular across, just across the board are, are, are the low hanging fruit to market to. Sorry if I rambled, I'll, I'll stop there. Melissa, you didn't ramble, thank you. <laughs> um, not at all. Um, so uh, John, it's going to be your turn next. I just wanted to uh, answer to one of the comments in the chat. Um, so someone is saying, invite local groups like Extinction, Extinction Rebellion, Extinction Rebellions, and visit local um, vegan community supported agriculture and local food co-ops. So I think that this, you know, the first point here um, is an important point that Melissa also has just touched upon, which is also creating that connection with basically um, the food movement or environmentalists, basically people who have another um, priority and interest already in terms of sustainability um, and connecting with them. I think that I think that that is important. Um, we didn't have time for all the topics during this town hall, but I think that uh, how to work with other social movements is, is a big topic because there's a lot of potential, but it can also be difficult. Um, I used to, you know, my thing is I don't want to just be preaching to the choir. So I've gone often and spoken to non-vegan audiences. And so what I try to tell them, or one of the things is um, that you know, if you're going towards agroecology or towards organics or towards your regenerative system for certain reasons, um, going a step further and doing it without the animal exploitation actually is sort of like a culmination or the better version of that thing. So if the idea is that you want to increase biodiversity, showing that doing not only agroecology, but vegan agroecology, for example, well, it's going to help increase biodiversity in these ways. And so basing oneself on what already is the interest there and then showing that veganics, um, at least in many cases, can help with doing even more of that. And so some veganic farmers, or at least I know of one who's written books and who's very well known, um, really started out with the idea of or more than one, but really started out with the idea of independence from this corporate food system, not only, but just the, the wasteful industries that we all participate in. And so the way to be truly independent of that was by breaking all those links and that ultimately meant going veganic. So I think that's, um, that's important, not that it's always easy to get people to see it that way, but if we insist. But but as to actually this idea that the vegans are gonna be the most responsive, so we actually did do that, as see the comments, we actually did organize field trips um, and created those connections with local growers. Um, we brought local farming farmers to events and we organized for um, local animal rights people to learn about veganics and go on a field trip and so on. Um, and ultimately, as I said, like the CSA that was in the Bay Area has failed financially because they didn't have enough support. So perhaps now it might start getting 
more there, but I think that um, but th there's a there's a certain aspect of the messaging that's not quite getting through to the vegans and and just the field trips are not doing it. I think there needs to be more sensitization, but um, but I don't want to take up too much time. So John Flores. I didn't see him in uh, Kim, uh, thank you everyone for hosting this uh, fantastic panel. I really appreciate the discussions and all the ideas that are thrown around here. Um, I know my time is limited here, but um, I think one of the ways that we can, I, I guess I wanna talk about some like pain points first and then kind of get to some ideas. I think one of the pain points in um, getting the conversation started with veganic agriculture is um, yeah, the, the idea that a lot of vegans have currently is that, you know, we think that consumerism is going to like solve all our world's problems, like, you know, vegan consumerism and we're going to buy all these products and then people are going to go vegan. But we really don't take the extra step to taking a look at, hey, how did, how did that spinach bag get to uh, my fridge? Like, we don't really go think about that um, from like, uh, from the systems perspective, like, you know, where did this come from? What did the farm, you know, what practices does the farm, uh, wh what do they do on the farm? So um, it's kind of one of the pain points and I do, um, I do relate to not getting enough support. I'm trying to do, uh, create conversation here in Los Angeles and Los Angeles has like all these like mini towns and like cities involved. Uh, or there's just like a lot of uh, in, like towns involved in Los Angeles. So trying to get that conversation started has been a little difficult. Um, I did get some traction. I started a like mini campaign um, uh, called Spread Seeds Not COVID uh, in 2019, beginning of 2019. I saw like the need to grow our own food. So I started growing um, in my own land here, just small scale and hosted some things uh, online. Um, but I think one of the, so I'll talk about like some of the ideas that I, I think of is definitely utilizing some, some technology that I've, I've heard, um, you know, other panelists speak about. Um, definitely utilizing technologies um, is uh, definitely needed. Um, I'm a transitioning full stack developer. So I, I run a business, a vegan business, and I'm transitioning to be a full stack developer, like you know, be really well versed in tech. Um, so I think maybe if there was an application, like, you know, how we have like a lot of people interested in fitness and wealth, like what if we had an application where people can download um, and like maybe there's some small segments of, hey, like, where do I start? Like, maybe I can start like how to compost and um, where do I compost? You know, what cities are um, offering compost? I know we talked about composting systems, uh, which is definitely needed. Uh, maybe like start there, like maybe there's a, you know, someone, I don't know how we would get this funding. That's always a problem, right? How do we get this funding? Who's going to pay for this? <laughs> but um, yeah, if there was a technology like that, I think that could, we can get like a lot of vegans um, excited about it because I know we're really excited about how we consume, like uh, what's the latest vegan product, but like, what if, you know, we can create the conversation, hey, what's the latest veganic agriculture um, alliance? I think some of the, um, some ideas too is to you know, share resources and collaboration as well is I know a lot of like us vegans are very like uh, virtuous or or like want to say hey like I want to do this on my own but like the time is uh, now that is you know it's it's needed right now is uh, collaboration so I think that we need to utilize that and share resources and I, I do see like a lot of especially in like san farm sanctuaries you have a lot of competition but um I think if we get to, you know, co-opetition, maybe like we do create like a healthy competition, like, hey, who's gonna scale the, the quickest? Like if we create like this, uh, this energy and movement behind it, I think we can get a lot of vegans behind it. Um, that's some of the ideas that I think about. There's also um, uh, someone that I came across that uh, through the animal rights uh, conference that was hosted here in Los Angeles about three years ago. He's an app developer um, and he develops like these, these uh, applications, online applications, where you can uh, start your own food delivery business. I'll link it up here in the comments. Um, but I think if we also um, utilize like maybe creating like a farm box and because um, a lot of people right now are 
have been forced to take a look at like um, their own consumption habits. So a lot of people are asking for like really high quality um, produce. So maybe if we can, um, I know there's some chefs on here. I know um, maybe we can like work with chefs um, to have a like a, a strong front. Um, we can utilize chefs in like creating these farm boxes so that way people can buy and that can create like a, uh, some great momentum as well. Thank you for that. Uh, Ella is next. Hi. Um, so I just wanted to um, to give like a very quick update on um, uh, maybe some areas that may not have as much focus um, within the movement yet, but um, might be a, a good path to go. Um, so I've been looking for veganic produce just kind of for my own reasons. Once I heard about, um, I reached out to one of the farmers and they're like, okay, we use horse manure. And I said, no. <laughs> um, so um, besides re looking at like the farmers and the farmer's market, I don't ask them, are you guys veganic or would you guys be um, interested in being certified veganic? I just ask them about the fertilizer if they're if they're using like kelp based fertilizer um and i emphasize please plant based only no cow manure no nothing um then they will let me know and i will you know buy my food from them so far i've had um some success of course you know being labeled veganic it's a long-term commitment i know that these farmers that, that i've asked they could at any point switch to something with animal products and i would have to ask them every week but then also there um there are farm there are um products that i've reached out at supermarkets like i was trying to find um some kind of veganic tofu there's a um there's a tofu um a uh, tofu producer in San Diego. And when I emailed them about the fertilizer, at first they said, yes, it's all plant-based, but then they actually came back to me um, very sincerely and said, actually they do um, put some kind of manure once or twice per year. And I asked them that if they would consider looking into um, sourcing from a veganic farm and if they do, could they notify me? And they were actually really happy to, they said, yes, we will, we will definitely we, you know, look into this portion. Um, same for a um, Olive Garden from Italy, which I actually, I just picked it up from Whole Foods and I emailed their customer service. And actually the owner who owns the Olive Grove um, contacted me and said for, um, for one of the higher blends that they're doing, um, it's his own farm, and they do uh, they have applied animal manure in the past, but they don't anymore. And I asked them, um, would you consider switching that to some kind of plant based stuff because there's sea kelp and there's so so many other. I know from talking to other orchards, um, there are alternatives now. And he said he will he will look into it. So um, that's just um, I feel like it's it's it might be just a small market that you're reaching out to but targeting um um i think one of the olive garden farmers made a comment that he used to be vegan and um just from my questions like maybe five or six of them said that's really interesting question um i've never had this question asked to me um even hydroponic farmers they said it's a good indicator of where this our plant-based movement is going and it kind of opens them up to like if you want to get ahead of the game then um start looking that way <laughs> and that, that's all i had i i wanted to share that thank you ella thanks so much um so there are a lot of uh, comments in the chat and everything and still obviously uh questions that weren't answered um so we're really happy that people are so participant um but of course we can't go all day um i don't know if people would want to go all day but maybe next time we can go all day um so i wanted to comment um so andy was not able to to um get his audio working. So he wrote in the chat instead about developing markets for veganic fertilizers so people can use it um, in their gardens and so on. Um, and I think, you know, for, you know, I think that for people who are starting home gardens, it is good for them to be able to have access to those sorts of products, both because immediately they're not buying animal products. And then there's also the larger benefit of it always plants awareness about what it is that we're actually using to, to grow food. Um, however, I want to use that to kind of go back to what I was saying at the, the beginning of this event that, um, and also I say this because of like a lot of comments about how can we get the vegan funders to get interested in veganics and so on. And so this also ties into that. So 
what I saw for years is that there was no interest. And then recently, because Kiss the Ground came out, for example, everybody's like, how do we debunk this? And the vegan funders are all, you know, there is starting to be more interest. But, um, but I think the interest is really more on the vegan side. People are using the word veganic because it's been put out there. A lot of us have, have made the effort to get the word out into public awareness. And so now people are like, oh, okay, so there's veganics and, and let's try to put that forth. But I think for a lot of vegans, really the only interest is in things being vegan. And we're losing sometimes not only the organic piece, but in terms of Seed the Commons, we wanna go beyond organic. We really want to promote agroecology. We want to promote truly regenerative and um, you know, uh, it, regenerative agroecological approaches that, that are not just about not using certain type of inputs, but really restoring ecosystems and so on. So we've had in this webinar series, we've had someone from the biointensive method who's come and spoken about how that's a potential for doing that and how they rebuild soil. We've had Helen at how we've had Ian Tolhurst those two are coming back next week. So there's really more of a focus on, um, you know, not just the bare minimum of what vegan and organic can be. Um, and in some cases, like in my personal experience, I've I've contributed um, labor, work ideas, et cetera, to um, people who've then turned around and in the vegan world and promoted GMOs. And so they were not actually interested in veganics. They were interested in vegan farming and GMOs are not veganic. So, um, so the risk I see with kind of having our focus too much on how do we talk to the big funders is that, I mean, the big funders in the vegan world are not typically people who are uh, in line with a more radical vision. As I said, like a lot of, not, I mean, several people have told me about their difficulty in approaching funders because their politics are more radical and you can't criticize neoliberalism and you can't criticize capitalism and so on. And so I think that I would really like to propose to the people here that, um, you know, that it would be good to stay true to a certain grassroots vision um, and to, again, not try to have a vegan version of the corporate food system we already have, but to have a vegan version of what social movements around the world um, now are putting forth, which is something else entirely, which is, you know, farming systems that are disconnected from big corporations and that are truly about soil regeneration and all these other um, benefits to people, to the planet. Um, and so I say that because yes, there is a role to, you know, for fertilizers and there should be something that gardeners can go and buy. And I, I don't disagree with that, but ultimately uh, the vision that we would like to help put forth is what Helen Athow, for example, was speaking about, which was growing her own fertilizer on the farm and having a closed loop system. So I wanted to, to take advantage to kind of um, invite us to kind of put the, the vegan onto those movements as opposed to onto a more um, corporate minded movement. So I don't know if the panelists have anything to say. Just uh, maybe some concluding words. I, I must say I'm, a, I'm very overwhelmed by all the inspiration we are getting tonight and it's just amazing. Uh, so it's, it's really a fantastic exchange and I'm really looking forward to have the time to read all the comments because there's a treasure of ideas and proposals and links to look at. And I think this is just an outcome, you know, putting so many people together around one topic and everybody has a different point of view, a different vision. This is just, uh, as I said, it's, I'm overwhelmed, so I cannot give any comment on any detail anymore, but I can just say uh, this has been a very beautiful evening uh, for having all this exchange and there uh, will probably be a lot of new opportunities to come together and to go on with this discussion. Uh, I think we have to go home to digest everything and to put something into practice. And I think everybody goes also home with some new ideas and it, they need some time to ripen maybe, but I'm sure there will be new, as we're talking about agriculture, there are new, new seedlings and it's spring now and they're going to grow and some of them will become big trees, I'm sure, seeing over everything that is happening tonight. So from my side, I can just say, thank you for, for everything we, uh, we have shared tonight and all the inputs from everybody. 
let let me thank you also uh, for being with you this evening. For us, it's evening. For you, it's the midday or the morning. Um, uh, yes, I, I'm really astonished about the uh, the questions and the uh, uh, the insights given by the participants. Um, it is uh, not easy for us uh, panelists to to see what happens in the, in the surf on the surface and behind the surface. And I would really like to have the chance to uh, go in depth uh, in some of these topics which have been um, uh, discussed today. And uh, I feel the urgent need to uh, to come more frequently together. We have just uh, put some highlights on some points, but we have to 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 go into and in, into. Uh, into more details, I think. Um, the whole uh, topic of uh, veganic and, or as we call it, biopsychic vegan farming is so complex and uh, meets such a big uh, bunch of, of uh, aspects. We have to, we have to, yeah, we have to find together. Thank you so much for being with you. And hopefully we can repeat it. <laughs> Yeah, I want to thank really the panelists, Johannes, Axel, but also Mona, who had to leave. I really want to thank you for spending so much time for us with us. I know that it, it's not an easy short event. It really asks a lot and it's nighttime for you. And also to all the people who are participating, not only who are attending this long event, but who are you know, adding to the chat and to the Q&A. And I know a lot of you have a lot of experience um, working and thinking about these things. So I really appreciate that. And I, I want to find a way to do justice to all the ideas that you've been putting out. I know that we didn't have time to answer all the questions. Um, so Chum and I are going to brainstorm a little bit about how we can, you know, how we can address that in some way, um, and what that will look like. Do we send the questions to the panelists and then bring you a document? Do we do another event? But we'll try to do something with that. Um, and so in the meantime, I also want to mention that, um, you know, this is springtime and I really wanted to do something for springtime. I wanted to use today to talk about, you know, how can we really get the ball rolling and really build this movement and make it into something so much bigger than it is now. And, you know, these issues around organizing and so on. But next week is um, what is it that we're working towards? What is ultimately a vision of what a truly, um, I guess, sustainable, um, you know, humane, compassionate, regenerative uh, farming system will look like. And so for that, we're going to have Helen Athow and Ian Tolhurst. They've both been veganic farmers for a very long time. They've both been involved in the organic movement for a very long time. They've both spoken here um, before, but next week is going to be a little bit special. Next week is the day before the spring solstice and also Persian New Year, which we do celebrate at See the Commons. And so it's going to be an opening into a new year, into springtime, and Helen and Ian are going to ask each other questions. So I think that's going to be a fun way of, of doing that. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much to everybody. Um, and uh, that's it for now. We'll post more on the Facebook page. Um, and that's it. Thank you.